and uh, transformers are all the rage today, uh, thanks to uh, things like GPT and BERT. And so let's uh, take some time to understand uh, what transformers are. So this section gives you an introduction to the transformers architecture. So it uh, goes from uh, starting from sequence model all the way to uh, transformers. So the starting point uh, for transformers are uh, sequence to sequence models. So sequence to sequence um, models are again uh, can be used in translation summarization like we saw earlier. Um, and so the most popular architecture is known as the encoder decoder architecture, which is shown on the right. So the encoder consists of a sequence uh, of uh, again a sequential neural network such as an RNN or an LSTM or by LSTM. And the idea is uh, each step in the input sequence generates a contextual embedding of the text so far. And the idea is, uh, so here is a French example. Um, and, and the first word generates an embedding. Uh, these can be thought of uh, sim similar to uh, glove or word to vec embeddings, but these are contextual. So the embedding output depends on the history of the input sequence so far. And so uh, the idea of an encoder is if we look at the embedding of the last word in the input sequence, uh, this represents the full context of the input sequence so far. Right? Um, and uh, the idea of a decoder is we take uh, the representation of the input sequence, which is essentially the embedding or the contextual embedding of the last token and use it in order to generate the output sequence. So the second step, the decoder is uh, trying to do a generation task. And so in order to do that, uh, if, if we prime the decoder uh, with a special token uh, such as start. And the idea is it generates an embedding of the first word in the output. Uh, so in this case, it is he. Uh, we take that output, feed it as a context uh, to the next step and it generates the second word. Uh, we feed it as a context, generates the third words and so on. And uh, it produces a variable length output. Uh, we terminate the output when it generates a special token um, such as end. So the decoder consists of a special token start to prime the decoder and a special token called end that uh, signifies the end of the output uh, sequence. And uh, so this is very generic um, and, you know, uh, gated recurrent units, LSTMs, by LSTMs have all been used to build these encoder decoder architectures. And so one of the problems that we have in this uh, architecture is we rely on the fact that the contextual embedding produced in the last token is the full representation of the input. And so this is all the information the decoder has in order to generate the entire output sequence. And so this can be thought of as an informational bottleneck. So the representation strength is limited to the representation strength of our embedding or contextual embedding. And, and so the solution to this problem uh, was uh, uh, attention. So uh, what attention does is allows the decoder uh, to attend or pay attention to all the embeddings in the input. And, and so, uh, at the same time, we want to uh, not explode uh, the input dimension or the encoding dimensions. And so attention solves this in a smart way is uh, it looks at all the input embeddings, all the contextual embeddings at the input sequence and produces a single vector uh, that can be used uh, to augment, augment the decoder state. All right, uh, so, so let's look at this. So we still have the same encoder sequence. Each of the words in the in input sequence is generating a contextual embedding. All right, and uh, the first decoder state has access to all the contextual embeddings. And so what it does is it creates a scoring for each of the input embeddings. So uh, it computes what is called as an attention score. Uh, we will uh, see how it uh, computes the attention score uh, soon, uh, but uh, it's, it's based on a similarity metric. So uh, the first step is computing the attention score. This is producing a weighting uh, for of the input contextual embeddings. And so uh, given this weight, uh, 
we can use a weighted sum of all the contextual embeddings from the input sequence as a way to augment the representation of uh, the output sequence. So uh, in the decoder, uh, in, in addition to the decoder state, we have a weighted sum of the input encoder states. Right? So this increases the uh, representation capacity and allows each step in the decoder uh, to attend to different parts of the input because of the attention scores. So in this example, again, um, so uh, the first step in the decoder is considering all the uh, input sequences, uh, but way, putting a very heavy weight on the first uh, input token. So this is very similar to the alignment schemes used in uh, translation or even a neural translation. And so neural tra this can be thought of as a soft alignment. So the uh, first token in the output is produced by paying attention uh, mostly to the first input sequence. And so similarly, if you look at the last token, uh, the last token might uh, decide to pay attention uh, to the last token in the input sequence. And so the attention score will be high for the last token in the input sequence and low for the uh, first few uh, tokens in the input sequence. And, and so the idea is, um, so let's consider an output sequence. Um, um, so the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. So what is it referring to in the input sequence? And so uh, one way to interpret attention is uh, what is it? Uh, the attention score is uh, high on the first few words. And therefore you can think of uh, the decoder uh, at state where at the output token it is trying to pay attention uh, to the animal or the subject or to the street. Uh, right? um, and, and so this is sort of the uh, interpretation of attention is, is what is it trying to consider uh, when generating the current output word. Okay. So that, that, that is what attention is. And um, so uh, there was a landmark paper uh, by uh, authors from Google, uh, Vaswani et al. that said, uh, you know, uh, most of the benefit of uh, translation is coming from uh, attention. Can we eliminate uh, the sequence part of the uh, neural network altogether. Can we replace LSTMs by LSTMs by a flat uh, a, a model or, or a non-sequential uh, model where time is not important and every node can uh, see every other uh, input sequence. And so the, this, is, this architecture uh, is what uh, became the transformer. So uh, in, in summary, uh, the transformer is um, a sequence to sequence model it's an similar, it, it, similar to sequence to sequence. It has an encoder block and a decoder block, except in, in this case, uh, every uh, a node has access to all the input uh, elements. So th there is no concept of time. Uh, we will see it's uh, the notion of the sequence order is introduced uh, through a position embedding. And, and so uh, much of the material that I'm going to show is uh, derived from an e a really excellent uh, uh, blog by Jay Alamar uh, called the Illustrated Transformer. Uh, there are other variants called Illustrator BERT, uh, which I will also use uh, in this talk. So uh, let, let's start. So this is uh, the building block of a uh, transformer uh, is an encoder stage and a decoder stage. So an encoder stage takes an input sequence and a decoder stage generates an output sequence. Uh, in this case, they happen to be translation, but we can uh, assume the same uh, holds true for summarization, right? Um, and so the transformer uh, is a specific architecture which has multiple encoder layers. Um, the original transformer paper had uh, six encoder layers. And the idea of having multiple layers is, uh, is two twofold. One is uh, it increases the representation strength. So as you go higher up in the layers, uh, you encode higher concepts. So at the lowest layer, you're paying attention to words, and maybe at the high layer, you're paying attention uh, to meaning. Right? So, so, so the idea is uh, you build abstraction as you go higher up. And uh, this is also how most of the convolutional neural networks used in computer vision also work. So as you go higher up in the layers, uh, you try to encode more complex objects. Uh, two is it uh, increases uh, learning capacity. So it adds uh, additional parameters to the model and therefore you can learn more complex input sequences. 
the other benefit of using multiple layers is uh, that as you go higher up, it has more and more context. Right, so at, at the lowest layer, you're trying to uh, pay attention to individual words. At the high, next highest layer, you're trying to pay attention to uh, a combination of uh, n-grams and so on. So at a very high layer, it has visibility or is trying to encode entire input sequences. So this is uh, the encoder layer. Uh, again, the original transformer paper had six encoder layer. We will see how this has changed over time. And it consists of uh, another uh, hierarchical decoder stage. So again, uh, with six different stages. Uh, and I so uh, similar to how we saw attention in uh, sequential networks, in this case, the decoder has access, every stage in the decoder has access to the output of the encoder. Okay, so let's look at the individual encoder block now. So uh, each layer in the encoder consists of a self-attention layer. So this is uh, uh, similar to the attention that we saw earlier. We'll talk more about it. Um, followed by a feed-forward layer. So a feed-forward layer you can think of as a, um, a feature detector, uh, similar to how uh, it's used in um, convolutional neural networks. And so the idea is uh, self-attention figures out what parts of the input sequence are important. Uh, and uh, the feed-forward layer is trying to uh, detect certain um, uh, features within the input. The decoder state has a self-attention layer. Um, and again, uh, it pays attention to all the tokens in the encoder layer, followed by a feed-forward layer. And so these are the individual building blocks of uh, one stage of encoder and one stage of decoder. So a transformer handles attention differently than what we saw in uh, sequential neural networks. In the sequential neural network, you saw one of the ways to compute attention was by computing similarity or dot product similarity between uh, the hidden state of the decoder and the, and the contextual embedding or the hidden state of the encoder. Uh, a transformer does attention in a slightly different manner. So uh, the input sequence is transformed into an embedding uh, called a key vector. Uh, this is simply done by taking the input um, embedding and multiplying it with a, a key matrix, uh, producing a key vector. So in this case, it consists of two input sequences. It's multiplied by a key vector to produce uh, two key, a key matrix to produce two key vectors. Similarly, the input sequence is multiplied with a query matrix to produce a query vector and also a value vector. So transformer handles. So in the sequential model, we saw attention consists mostly of computing the similarity between the hidden state of the decoder and the hidden state of the encoder uh, at each, each input token. Transformer computes attention slightly differently than what we saw in the sequential network. In the sequential network, attention consists of computing the similarity between the hidden state of the current decoder state and all the encoder states in the input. Transformer does this slightly differently. So in the transformer, uh, each input is multiplied with three separate matrices. Uh, these are called the query matrix, the key matrix, and the value matrix. Instead of taking the weighted sum of the encoder states, uh, a transformer takes a weighted sum of the value vectors that we just computed. And so you can think of the flow uh, as seen in the figure here. So uh, you get a, a query matrix, a query vector, a key vector. Uh, you, you multiply that in order to generate um, a similarity score. And you use the value vector and compute a weighted sum uh, to compute the state, uh, the attention state Z. And so the idea is uh, by adding the query vector, the key vector and the value vector, you're increasing the number of parameters and therefore the uh, representation capacity of the network. You can also think of the query vector and uh, the query matrix and the key matrix as feature detectors uh, that are uh, sitting on top of the embeddings of the input sequence. So transformer goes a step further. Instead of using a single attention mechanism, it uses multiple attention heads. So each head can be again thought of as a feature detector in the input sequence. And um, so example, so instead of having one query vector, uh, in this case, you have two query vectors and therefore you produce two attention uh, uh, vectors which can be concatenated with each other. So in fact, uh, the transformer uh, paper uh, 
used eight attention heads. So the idea being uh, each input sequence generates an attention state. In this case, uh, eight attention states that can be concatenated uh, to each other. And intuitively, the idea is each attention head uh, can encode some aspect of the input sequence. So one of the attention heads we saw earlier, um, it is trying, so in order to generate uh, the output after it, it is maybe uh, the first attention head might be trying to pay attention to the subject in the input sequence, in which case that it could be the animal or it could be the street as you see in the uh, orange attention head. Or it could be uh, referring um, to some uh, a reason. Uh, so in this case, it's it's trying to it is trying to pay attention to was too tired. The pink attention head is trying to maybe figure out uh, the reason. And so again, uh, these are uh, intuitive uh, interpretations of what attention is really doing. Uh, but you can think of them as uh, feature detectors. So a transformer architecture uh, uses eight attention heads in every layer. There you go. So it's it's this was one of the uh, contributions of the transformer paper is uh, using a multi attention head and uh, increased uh, the accuracy of the model a lot. And so uh, when we finally look at um, the final representation of uh, the encoder state, we are concatenating all of these uh, attention vectors together. So um, I think I mentioned this in the past is a transformer is able to look at all the input tokens simultaneously. So there is really no inherent representation of a sequence. Right? Um, and in order to overcome this, uh, the authors uh, added, uh, in addition to the word embeddings at every position, they also added a position embedding. And the idea of is that in order to represent a token, we will add the word embeddings which uh, could be context-free to the position embeddings in order to generate a position-dependent encoding of the current word. Um, so in, in this case, it's je suis étudiant, je appearing in the first, um, the encoding of je appearing in the first position in the input sequence will be different from the encoding of je appearing in the second or third position in the in input sequence. And, and so uh, they had a scheme, uh, unlike the input embedding that is learned, uh, the position embedding is, um, is hardwired. So it, you can, uh, this is an example of a position, position embedding. It, uh, this is uh, using, so each position is represented uh, in, in a vector of 512. So uh, part of it is, a sinusoidal representation and a cosine representation. So there are uh, two complementary representations. You can think of it as representing the phase. Um, and so the first word, uh, the, the position embedding of the first word is slightly different from position embedding of the zeroth word and position embedding of the tenth word is a different vector representation. So these get added on to the uh, word embeddings at each uh, token to produce a position dependent uh, token representation or embedding. Okay, so uh, let's look at uh, the summary. So there are a lot of moving steps. So the first uh, step is the positional encoding. So positional encoding is done by adding the positional embedding vector to the uh, input uh, token embedding vector. Then the input sequence goes through a multiple uh, attention heads to produce a single attention state vector. This is passed through the feed forward network, which we thought of as, as feature detectors. Um, in addition, we've used the trick of uh, layer normalization and residual connections. So uh, layer normalization and residual connections are used uh, to make the network converge much faster and uh, are also found in the computer vision neural network architectures. So residual connections allow you to propagate the input the token much faster and uh, avoids the uh, diminishing gradient problem. Right, uh, so uh, this is uh, the entire transformer. So each layer consists of positional embedding, attention, layer normalization, feed forward networks, uh, followed by norm normalization again. And there are six such encoder layers within the transformer architecture. 
Okay, so let's look at the decoder. The decoder is uh, slightly complicated uh, because it has, in, a, in addition to the self-attention, it also has an encoder decoder attention layer. So let's look at the decoder here on the right. So uh, the decoder takes as input um, one of the, um, the, uh, the embedding of the output token. So uh, we usually prime the decoder by giving a special token such as start. And for subsequent positions, it's the previous word uh, or the previous output as, uh, as the input token. So in addition to the self-attention layer, the decoder also has an encoder decoder attention layer where it is able to attend to uh, different input tokens in the, in the encoder based on the context. So uh, it also has a feed forward layer and a normalization layer with residual connections similar to the encoder block uh, that we saw earlier. So, and uh, Transformer again has multiple such decoder layers. Uh, in the original paper proposed six such decoder layers. So uh, let's look at all the entire Transformer architecture in summary. So uh, it uses positional encoding to differentiate between different positions of the input. It uses attention head as feature detectors, and it uses a feed forward uh, a layer followed by normalization. Right? And so there are N such encoding layers and N such decoding layers. Let's look at the summary of the entire transformer network. We have looked at different building blocks. So, uh, so it, it consists of N number of enco encoder layers followed by N number of decoder layers. Each encoder layers has positional embedding, multiple attention heads, feed forward layer with residual connections and normalization. Each decoder layer has positional embedding, followed by multiple attention heads, a encoder decoder attention head, feed forward layer with normalization and residual connections. So, uh, so the transformer in essence consists of six such encoder heads followed by six such decoder heads. And the output uh, could be used for any task specific problems such as classification or uh, language generation. And so transformer uh, w was a landmark paper because uh, a, it removed the sequential nature and um, allowing transformers to be trained in parallel. So uh, you can make use of GPU acceleration. So transformer models can be trained much faster uh, than sequential neural network models such as um, RNNs, LSTMs, and GRUs and so on. So that was one benefit. It had a much lower computational cost uh, compared uh, to traditional encoder decoder architectures and uh, generated uh, significantly higher accuracy. And so uh, after the transformer was introduced, uh, all uh, most of the uh, uh, recent research uh, are, is based on some variation of the transformer network. So let's now look at a specific uh, variation of transformer, uh, which is BERT. So uh, let's look at a specific variation of a transformer architecture called BERT. So uh, when BERT was introduced uh, by Devlin et al. from Google, it was seen as a very landmark paper uh, heralding um, NLP's ImageNet movement. It was one of the earliest works that used pre-training uh, in order to produce task-independent representation of uh, language. And the idea was that we can use BERT uh, in, and pre-train it on a massive data set, such as the book corpus and Wikipedia, on a completely different task, such as uh, predicting mask word or language models, and then fine tune it to specific tasks, such as classification or named entity recognition or entailment and so on. Um, and again, um, uh, some of the material uh, that I'm going to be using is again from an excellent uh, uh, blog post by uh, Jay Alamar called Illustrated BERT. Uh, it, it was called uh, NLP's ImageNet moment because uh, 
few years ago, uh, computer vision uh, had a, a similar, uh, I guess, uh, the original breakthrough where uh, people trained models on a classification task on ImageNet dataset and found that uh, the model that is trained on ImageNet can be fine-tuned with very small amounts of data uh, to do multiple tasks. Uh, could be uh, object detection, or image classification, image tagging, and so on. And, and so BERT used a very similar approach. They trained it on a completely independent task on very massive amounts of data, and then found that this uh, trained model performed uh, very well, in fact, state of the art on uh, close to a dozen different NLP tasks without having trained originally on uh, these tasks. And so therefore it, it, it was a very landmark paper, but not, uh, you know, uh, not necessarily the first one. Uh, other approaches such as uh, ELMO and UN uh, This was not necessarily the first paper to do it. There were other approaches uh, before, such as ELMO and uh, ULM FIT that tried the same approach, but uh, BERT was landmark because it used massive amounts of data the transformer architecture, um, allowing uh, more efficient computation and faster training times and produced state-of-the-art results. Um, so while it was not the first, it was in, uh, the best in multiple dimensions. So now let's look at uh, the details of the trans uh, BERT. Now uh, let's look at uh, the inside details of BERT. So a BERT uses a transformer architecture. So it is a variant of a transformer. So it is much larger than what was proposed in the original transformer paper. Um, so uh, the BERT paper introduced two variants called BERT base and BERT large. BERT base doubled uh, the number of layers. The BERT large quadrupled it. It also cha changed the size of the intermediate embedding vectors um, and the number of attention heads. So BERT is a, a much larger transformer, uh, but the, the changes are not limited uh, to the architecture itself. So uh, BERT used, in addition to a position embedding, it used another embedding called the segment embedding, uh, meant to distinguish um, sentences within the input sequence. Right. Uh, but I think the a primary difference between the original transform paper and BERT is uh, BERT relies on uh, the notion of pre-training right? and uh, on massive data sets. And so uh, when ULM fit, ELMO were all uh, pre-trained, I think one of the tasks was language generation tasks. So they used massive amounts of data and in, um, also GPT falls in the same category. They used massive amounts of data and uh, in every input sequence trying to predict the next token. But because transformer has visibility to the entire input sequence, asking it to predict the next sequence, uh, it doesn't make any sense. It, it can just copy the input sequence. And so the BERT ca came up with two uh, interesting uh, tasks to train the transformer model. One was the masked word prediction and next sentence prediction. In fact, they, they trained uh, uh, both of these together. And so let's look at the first one. Um, so let's look at the pre-training approach uh, in more detail. Um, like I mentioned, uh, previous approaches such as ULM FIT, ELMO, and GPT uh, use the next uh, word prediction. So as I mentioned, previous approaches such as ULM FIT, ELMO, GPT use the language modeling task, predict next word in order to pre-train the models. Uh, but BERT uses uh, two tasks. One is called uh, the mask language model and the other one is the sentence uh, following task. Uh, let's look at the mask language model. Uh, the goal of the masked language model is given uh, an input sequence uh, where some of the words have been replaced by a special token or hidden by a special token uh, called mask. The goal is uh, to predict what, what that mask token was. And then, so the idea is to use the entire context of the input sequence to predict uh, the hidden word uh, by mask. And so in any given input, uh, the BERT training uh, replaced 15% of the tokens. Right? In addition, some of the tokens were randomly replaced, not by a mask vector, but by some other word. Right? Um, so if you look at this example, uh, improvisation uh, token is masked. 
And the goal is to maximize the probability of that uh, token in, in, in the output. So uh, this, is, this is just one of the tasks used to pre-train the BERT model. So it used a second task called the sentence following task. So in this case, the idea is the input sequence consists of two sentences, again, which could have mask within it, separated by a special token called separator. And the task is to figure out whether the sentence, the second sentence, sentence B, follows sentence A logically or not. And so the, uh, the task here is uh, to look at the output embedding and um, to classify whether sentence B follows sentence A or not. And intuitively, the idea is this forces BERT to represent higher contextual embeddings or to, to force it to learn meanings. Because in order to say a sentence B follows sentence A, you have to understand um, the sentence at a much higher level in, in a conceptual um, level than at the token level. And, and so uh, BERT trained the model uh, on uh, these two tasks. And variants of BERT have uh, tweaked the task somewhat or added additional tasks or uh, change the training procedure, uh, but the mask language model is is, is common to all va uh, variants of uh, BERT. Okay, so now given the pre-training model, uh, given the output of the pre-training, how do we adapt BERT to a specific task? And so the notion here used here was uh, similar to what is used in computer vision. Uh, where we take a model pre-trained on a large data set such as ImageNet and replace the last few layers of the network or adapt it to a specific task. So in computer vision, uh, the, the pre-trained model is known as a backbone and we uh, add a few task specific layers after the backbone and uh, adapt it to the task. And so when you tune a model, you can tune only the last few layers. And so it requires much uh, lesser amount of data than the data you, you use to pre-train the network. So in this case, uh, we used all of Wikipedia and Book Corpus to train the data. And, um, but the task specific um, uh, model can be much smaller. So uh, let's take an example of classification. So in order to uh, use BERT to do sentence classification, we um, add a special sequence in the input uh, called um, uh, classification and we take the embedding, the final embedding after all the layers of BERT uh, of the first token of, of the special classification token and feed it to a uh, feed forward neural network to, which is tuned for classification. Right. Um, and, and so we feed the entire input sequence, take only the first output uh, and uh, train a classifier on top of it. And so when you have a new data set, uh, you do not have to fine tune all the layers of BERT, but only tune or learn the weights of this new classifier layer. And therefore these are a much fewer number of parameters. And so uh, you can train it with a few thousand examples um, in, 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 as opposed to um, several hundred million or billion examples used in training the base BERT model or the backbone model. And then, so that is the idea. So uh, similar to classification, BERT can be adapted to multiple tasks. Um, and, and so the way to adapt it is uh, to change how you encode the input sequence. So when you're, uh, or, and how to post-process uh, the output sequence. And so a BERT, so in the uh, a BERT paper, the authors used the BERT model, um, the pre-trained BERT model and adapted it to multiple tasks. Right. And uh, these tasks could be categorized whether they use two sentences, single sentences, or uh, uh, at, they are at the uh, token level. What was the most impressive here is having pre-trained on the masked language model and the sentence uh, pair uh, task or the sentence following task, BERT achieved state-of-the-art performance on multiple tasks in the GLUE benchmark. So the GLUE benchmark uh, consists about uh, more than 10 separate tasks and BERT, uh, variants of BERT achieved state-of-the-art performance. In this case, BERT large achieved state-of-the-art performance across all the tasks across the board. And uh, so this is one of the reasons that 
the appearance of Bert was such an impactful moment in uh, NLP that all subsequent models on the leaderboard were variants of Bert. Right? In fact, it has led uh, to a whole bunch of variants uh, that are uh, uh, based on a BERT, but are uh, different in either the pre-training tasks that they use, uh, the objective function that they use, or uh, how they mask the input, and so on. That concludes the introduction to BERT. So this forms the... Hi everyone, this is Hong from Microsoft. In this video, I'm going to introduce a few variants and improvements of BERT. The models I'm going to cover today include XLNet, Roberta, T5, and Albert. So first of all, as some motivation, let's take a look at some popular leaderboards. And both Glue and SuperGlue are leaderboards for a collection of natural language understanding tasks. Glue is the first version containing 11 tasks, including text classification, sentence similarity, and the natural language inference. And Superglue is a new version with some more challenging tasks like co-reference resolution and multi-choice style question answering. As we can see, uh, T5 is ranked as num at number five on Glue and number two on Superglue. And Robota is at number five on Superglue. And there are three Albert-based models ranked at the top of the leaderboards. And for reading comprehension or question answering, RACE is a data set collected from English examinations created for middle school and high school students in China. And SQUAD is the Stanford question answering data set based on Wikipedia. As we can see, uh, Albert and Albert based models did really well on both boards. I'm going to briefly touch on ExcelNet. So ExcelNet proposed the permutation language model as an alternative to BERT to the BERT masked language model, and it did outperform the original BERT model when first came out. So the permutation language model is an autoregressive model, as the paper name suggested. And the key innovation here is instead of predicting the tokens in the sentence one by one, they permutate the order of the predicted tokens by controlling the attention mask. And in this way, the model is able to learn bidirectional context as BERT while preserving the correlation between mask tokens as autoregressive models. And they had to use something called a two-stream self-attention to make their prediction distribution aware of the target position. And they incorporated the key ideas of transformer XL, and this is why they are called XL match. So first they used the relative position encoding instead of absolute positional encoding. And they integrated segment recurrence where the memory from the previous segment is cached and used to update the attention matrix of the current segment. And it excluded the next sentence prediction tasks of BERT. And I'm not sure if they're the first one to do this, but most of the papers came out later found this task hurting model performance rather than helping. And data wise, XLNet was pre trained on much more data than BERT. And they also added the news, a news QA data set to their squad model fine tuning. And Robotha was proposed to explore the full potential of BERT. So they proposed a few design changes that improved the model performance without additional training data or time. So first, they used bigger batches. They used batches of 8,000 sequences versus 256 in BERT. And they trained only with full length sequences without random injection of short sequences as in BERT. And they also removed the next sentence prediction task as in XLNet. And instead of using fixed masks generated at data pre-processing time, they used the dynamic masking patterns when feeding the sequences to the model. And they used the byte level BP vocabulary containing 50,000 subword units. And with additional training time and the training data, they further boosted their model performance. And at the end, they 
concluded that BERT was significantly under-trained and they were able to get more performance out of BERT with the proposed design choices. And they believed that the masked language model is still competitive compared to the alternatives like, like Axelnet's permutation language model. And the next model we'll look at is T5, which stands for transfer learning with a unified text-to-text -text transformer. And the text-to-text -text framework generalized the various tasks as a task where the model is fed some text for context and the conditioning and is asked, asked to produce some output text. And to distinguish different tasks, they prefixed the input, input sequence with the task-specific text. And this framework allows them to apply the same model, objective, training procedure, and decoding process to different tasks. And the paper is more than 30 pages. This is the overall flow of it. So they started by introducing their baseline model, the C4 data set based on common crawl, and the downstream tasks, including glue, superglue, squad, and etc. And then they performed a series of experiments to evaluate how each design choice impacts the model performance and chose the best design choices for their final model. For architecture, they compared encoder decoder, causal language model like GPT, and prefix language model where the tokens are always allowed to see tokens in the prefix segment. And the prefix language model is useful for tasks like translation and summarization. And for pre-training objectives, they compare the GPT-style language modeling and BERT-style denoising, and masking tokens versus masking spans. And for pre-training data sets, they looked at the impact of pre-training data domain and data size. And for fine-tuning methods, they investigated how many parameters to fine-tune and different strategies of multitask fine-tuning. And for scaling, they're trying to ask, they try to answer the question, when you're given more computation power, what should you use it for? Should you train your model for more steps? Should you train a bigger model on bigger batches or train an ensemble of multiple models? And at the end, they proposed their final model based on the combination of the best design choices they found in their experiments. And they concluded with some key takeaways and outlook for future research directions. So we're going to skip the 20 pages of experiments and jump to the key takeaways from their experiments. The proposed text-to-text -text framework provides a simple way to train a single model on a wide variety of tasks. Architecture-wise, they found the encoder-decoder form worked best in the text-to-text -text framework. And for pre-training objectives, randomly masking spans of three tokens worked best. And for datasets, they recommended using large and diverse dataset in pre-training in general. And for training strategies, they found fine tuning after pre-training on a mixture of tasks produced a comparable performance to unsupervised pre-training. And for scaling, they found training a larger model for fewer steps was often better than training a smaller model on more data. And they also found that uh, the benefit of ensembling of multiple models. And this is the comparison of their baseline model and the final model with the combination of best design choices. Uh, first, uh, instead of masking individual tokens, they masked three token long spans. And for, for training batch size, they used uh, about 2,000 sequences. And for pre-training steps, they pre-trained for about twice of the steps than their baseline model. And for model size, they ended up with four models of different sizes, and their biggest and best model contains 11 billion parameters. And for multi-training, pre-training, multi-task task pre-training, they pre-trained on both unsupervised task and the supervised downstream tasks, which is a MTDN style training strategy. 
and for decoding, they used the they used a beam size of four instead of greedy uh, decoding. And at last, the author, the authors pointed out the limitations of the current models and suggested directions for future research. So first, they acknowledged that the current models are too large to be useful for client size inference or federated learning on edge devices, as well as re low resource tasks. So they advocated for research on small models with strong performance like the Steelbird. And although the T5, T5 model performance is very competitive, it's very, very expensive to train. And in their experiments comparing different pre-training objectives, they found the different variants of bird style pre-training pre objectives didn't make much difference. So they suggested exploring entirely different ways of leveraging unlabeled data with some more efficient knowledge extraction objectives. So one example is a paper from Stanford using again to distinguish between real, data, real text and machine generated text. And they suggested formalizing the similarity between pre-training and fine-tuning tasks can help choosing the best unlabeled data for pre-training. And at last they called for more language agnostic models. So the last model we will look at is Albert. And the key innovation of Albert is its parameter reduction techniques, which make it more memory efficient. And the first parameter reduction technique is factorizing embedding parameterization. And we will take a closer look at this in the next slide. And the second parameter reduction technique is cross-layer parameter sharing. So instead of having different parameters in different tra transformer blocks, all blocks share the same parameters. And this table compares the numbers of parameters and speed up between BERT and Albert. As you can see, because Albert uses parameter sharing across blocks and uh, the embedding size is only 128, they are able to use much larger hidden sizes while, use, while, while having fewer number of parameters than BERT. It's worth noting that when using the same data and the model setup, the performance of Albert large is actually worse than Bert large. And Albert X large is slightly better than Bert large. And Albert XX large is much better than Bert large. We also note that the speed of Albert X large and Albert XS large are slower than Bert large because of larger structures. So the better performance still comes with a price of slower speed. And the next innovation of Albert is the sentence order prediction objective. So although the next sentence prediction task has been found to hurt model performance, they still believe that learning inter-sentence inter relationship is important. And the pro problem with next sentence prediction is probably because it's too easy. So they came up with this new task of predicting whether two consecutive segments are presented in the correct order. And they took, took two consecutive segments from the same document as positive examples. And then they swapped the order of these two segments to generate, generate negative examples. And another interesting finding is that they found that removing dropout can help improving model performance by about 0.3. And for their final model, they pre-trained with the same data set as Excelnet and Roberta. Now let's take a closer look at embedding factorization. So for all previous variants of BERT, the word piece embedding size E was always the same as the hidden layer size H in order to perform matrix multiplication. And this makes embedding matrix unnecessarily large. And they pointed out that the word piece embeddings are meant to learn context independent representations, whereas hidden layer embeddings are meant to learn context dependent representations. So instead of projecting the one hot encoding vectors directly into the hidden space of size H, they first projected them into a lower dimensional space. In this case, and they found E equals to 128 gives them the best performance. And then they projected this smaller embedding 
matrix to the hidden space using this what I called a adapter layer of size E by H. So with this embedding factorization, they're able to reduce the embedding parameter number of embedding parameters from the order of V by H to the order of V by E plus E by H. So that's all for Albert and for this video. Thanks for watching. This is Said from Microsoft. Uh, in this module, I'm going to talk about knowledge distillation uh, in general and for transformer-based models. Um, so the idea is to uh, train smaller models uh, out of uh, huge, uh, larger models um, and that are bec becoming more dominant these days because of data and uh, uh, progresses in uh, computation and so on. Um, it, it's not re restricted to transformer-based models, but um, there's more need now for, for these because they're becoming larger and larger for, especially for uh, NLP tasks and maybe image or computer vision tasks. Um, the idea is simple at a high level. Um, you, you have a trained model that is huge and that you might want to, uh, to reuse in, in a smaller format or a compressed format. So it's a form of model compression. Uh, so what you do is uh, you try to generate predictions out of that uh, teacher model. Um, and, and then uh, you initialize a student model that is, uh, in, in most cases, smaller. Um, and tr you try to match those predictions or compute a loss between those predictions and train, uh, just like in, in a standard uh, training format. Um, and it's, it's all also optional to grab the data from the actual labels from the data set and use that as well uh, and maybe in an aggregate loss or a linear combination of the losses to to train on both the teacher predictions and the actual labels um, so that's the high level uh, um, framework for for knowledge distillation and um, so some parts are optional and there's a lot of parameters here you can uh, the teacher can be uh, initialized in, or created in many ways. The, the student can be initialized or even the architecture can be done in different ways. So that depends on the application. Um, I guess the, the when uh, uh, this paper, uh, model compression, uh, was one of the early ones that talked about uh, knowledge distillation. They didn't call it distillation back then. Um, it was uh, referred to as model compression. And in that uh, paper, they discussed how they uh, compress a large ensemble of models into a small one uh, using the same framework that I just described. And the key, the key point is that, is that they didn't want to use the actual uh, predictions or probabilities uh, that, that you can get from, a, from the large model, but rather the, this, some form of soft targets. And they opted to use the logits for that. And the argument was that the, the logits or the output of the of the model is um, b before you convert them into a probability distribution um, is a kind of a denser or uh, a vector or it contains more information or signal for for the student to learn from. Um, so that and and of course this this means that you can. Uh, maybe train better models using less data because there's more information in the uh, uh, in the labels generated and in the loss computed. Um, and also you can use a higher learning grade because this this would maybe converge faster in general. Um, and also because um, if you look at the, the actual labels in the here in the last um, uh, row of uh, in this example, you can see the labels can be uh, in many cases, there are just one hot vectors that don't contain much information except for the actual class where that class is. And the probabilities, although they're a nice representation, but sometimes they still lack uh, a lot of information compared to the logits. And, and if you've trained models and you inspected these uh, kind of probabilities, you, you know that a lot of uh, it's, it's not uncommon that you get a lot of uh, numbers close to zero and maybe one or two close to one. So that's that's the reasoning here. Um, 
you get a better distribution for for training at least for training the student model um, so, so once you get the logits out of the teacher model you can uh, do the same uh, for the student model in the forward pass during training and you can compute the loss and in, in this paper they use the square difference uh, between these two logits uh, but you can use any any loss that makes sense um, so that was uh, one of the early experiments on distillation. Um, and then shortly after, in 2015, uh, I guess here is where the, the word distillation was coin, coined. Um, in this paper uh, by Google, Google it's, it's called distilling knowledge in a neural network. And the key difference is here is that uh, the authors wanted to use temperature within, in, within the softmax uh, function. And this work is based on the previous one. It's, it, cites, it cites it, and it's very similar in the framework at a high level. But um, they argue here that using a temperature is, is, uh, is key to, to allow the use of the probabilities instead of the logits or, or the actual labels. So if you, if you look here at, the, at this, this example, you can see that you can, when you can go from logits to probabilities, you still have this uh, uh, skewness or uh, not very soft distribution. Uh, but if you use a higher T, which is uh, uh, where you, which is kind of a factor that you divide your logits uh, by, you get a, a smoother uh, distribution or, or, or more or softer distribution, and, and the numbers are closer to each other. So that. that uh, contains uh, kind of more information than uh, vectors that are kind of almost sparse. Um, so the higher the T, the, the smoother your uh, or softer your distribution is over the labels. Um, so, so you can experiment with, with, with many uh, values of T. In, in this paper, they, they did a few experiments, but one, in one of them at least, uh, they, the T equals two was the best. And so once you identify a good T, um, you can use that for distillation for both the teacher and student. So for the teacher, you, you generate the labels using that uh, softmax at the end uh, of the pass or of the prediction actually. And for the student, it's the, the forward pass where you, uh, at the time when you compute the loss. Um, so, you, so they use the same T and, and then they use uh, some, uh, in this case, cross entropy uh, to compute uh, the, the the difference between these two distributions, the students and the teachers, um, and then they they got pretty good results in using this, and uh, and they showed that they can outperform an ensemble of um, of models uh, using a single distilled model. Um, and so the, the argument here is, as well, is also uh, that the logits, uh, the probabilities might be sometimes better than, a, than, than the logits in, in, because they, they're, more, they're more normalized. Uh, so you can go in, in between the logits and the actual probabilities or the, the hard labels by, by varying the T. Um, and in the context of the of transformers, um, the next paper came that came uh, was uh, well. There there are many other papers that, that are related to this topic, but this one is uh, uh, an attempt to distill BERT, which is a very popular uh, model for NLP tasks, and it's called distill BERT here. And this is by the guys at uh, Hugging Face who created the transformers package. Uh, I'm sure many of you have used this before. Um, so this is the, actually the distillation of BERT itself um, applied at the pre-training phase, um, which means the, the, the teaching or the, the student uh, distillation is, is done at the modeling uh, objective and not at, at the fine tuning task or fine tuning phase or during the fine tuning tasks. So this resulted in 40% in less parameters, 60% faster models, and using two, two times less layers and 
also retaining 97% of the performance, uh, which is great for something like Bird because Bird itself is, is close to one gig of, of memory uh, or memory for footprint. And uh, the still Bird is, is much, much smaller, much, much faster. You can see the reduction in number of parameters of the network on the in this table here. Uh, almost half in total and much better inference time and uh, memory story uh, memory footprint um, so in, in in this case the they initialized the, the student model from the teacher uh, by removing one out of two layers um, because they they realized also that initializing using the actual layers of, of um, of the teacher model is, is beneficial and uh, uh, provides better results. Um, so, so in addition to the distillation loss, which is the loss that compares the outputs of the teacher and the student, they added two, uh, the mask language modeling loss, which is the one used in the, in the previous, in the actual BERT's uh, pre-training uh, uh, phase. So they use the same loss to to also compare the, the actual values of the in the data set. So not only the distillation loss, but the mass language modeling loss and the cosine embedding loss. And this cosine embedding is between uh, the outputs. It's like the distillation loss. It's also between the outputs of the, uh, uh, the uh, teacher and the student. And the distillation loss here is, is a cross entropy loss. And they, uh, Linearly, linearly combine these uh, as a linear combination of the three losses. Um, so they have some results here, and they showed that in most cases, uh, the still BERT is slightly less performant than the actual BERT base, uh, but much faster and much smaller. Um, Maybe except of the except uh, WNLI, the last uh, column in the first table, where the little bird uh, outperformed bird base, and you, you can see this pattern sometimes happening. Uh, and uh, I guess the explanation is that uh, distilling is, is kind of a form of a compression, but also uh, even though it's lossy, it, it's uh, it kind of reduces noise and sometimes might be helpful for generalization. Um, and for downstream tasks, you can see here, they computed the accuracy on IMDB, uh, the, the classification task and the question answering on squad. And they show that uh, the results are also very close on fine during fine tuning. Um, the still bird D here in the, in the last uh, uh, row is um, one that is uh, distilled twice, one, dur one during the pre-training phase and one during the uh, fine tuning phase. Um, on the squad uh, task in this case. So I did a small experiment here. Um, as I said, the, the authors uh, have this nice package, transformers package, and they, they host the models as well. You can uh, use them easily. Um, so what I did is, is try to compare the uh, performance on AG News Corpus, and that's a uh, very popular. Uh, and, news data set that you that is used in classification or other NLP tasks. So I sampled half of the data set, 60k training examples and 3.k training uh, testing examples. Um, this data set has four labels uh, of categories, uh, news categories. Um, and it is this, this on two uh, GPUs, two tests like 80 GPUs on an Azure machine. Um, it's a NC12 VM virtual machine. Uh, now I had some restrictions on the batch size and length of the sequence because of GPU memory issues. So I picked those uh, 24 batch size and 300 max length parameters. And I did this for one epic. The data set is big enough, so you don't need to do more than that. And you can see the F1 score uh, is very close, uh, almost the same if you round that. Um, whereas the, the time, the inference time and the fine tuning time is, is much, much, uh, it's almost half. Um, so you can see the advantage of using something like the silver and it's, it's readily, uh, 
and it's made available and uh, very easy to download and use. Um, I, I also plotted the loss here during fine tuning. Just uh, was curious to see if there's any uh, will be any difference because the architecture is different and it's a smaller model. But um, I couldn't spot anything um, out of the ordinary. It seems like it's uh, maybe slightly smoother, but you can't tell from this image. Um, so yeah, and in practice, the Silbert works very well on. Uh, I mean, unless you're doing research or trying to beat some benchmark, it's it's very convenient to use in production or uh, in everyday experiments. Hello, everyone. This is Alejandro from Microsoft. In this module, I will be reviewing fundamentals of PyTorch, a popular deep learning framework commonly used for natural language processing, computer vision, and other machine learning tasks. PyTorch is the framework used under the hood in the Microsoft Open Source NLP Best Practices Repository, which will be introduced in a later module. It is commonly used in machine learning tasks for many reasons, perhaps most notably its tight integration with Python, ease of use, and dynamic computation. In this module, I'll begin by reviewing neural network architectures commonly used for NLP tasks. I'll start with a general overview of recurrent neural networks, or RNNs, and then go into the specific RNN types of long short-term memory networks, or LSTMs, and gated recurrent units, or GRUs. Note that NLP has evolved past these RNN architectures in the past few years, with the state-of-the-art achieved by transformers with attention mechanism discussed in a previous module. I opt to use these architectures for simplicity as a lens to introduce PyTorch and demo some simple network examples. After reviewing RNNs, I'll review a quick example to show how to construct a network using basic PyTorch functionality. Finally, I'll train simple neural NLP models using two sample notebooks published on the PyTorch website. The first is an LSTM network for part of speech tagging in which we seek to label each word of an input sentence by its part of speech. The second is an RNN character level classification task in which the objective is for the RNN to determine the language of origin given a surname. Let's begin with a review of architectures. The concepts underlying RNNs date back to the 1980s. RNNs were developed in order to process sequences as inputs. Historically, in feed-forward neural networks, you must apply a single isolated example when doing inference and assume that examples are independent of each other. In NLP particularly, typically this is not the case when we are processing a sequence of text. You can imagine various NLP scenarios in which the input or output to the network is required to be a sequence. For example, in sentiment analysis, the network represents a many-to-one relation in which a sequence of text input is fed into the network and a sentiment label is returned. In machine translation, a sequence of text in the source language is fed into the network and a sequence in the target, target language is returned. RNNs were therefore introduced to add context dependency to the classical feed forward definition of neural networks. Here, a hidden state S of T can be thought of as the memory of the network, which is dependent on the previous hidden state and the input at the current time. S of T is a linear function of input X of T and previous hidden state S of T minus one, which is then pushed through an activation function F. Because of this, we can imagine the RNN as cyclic with the output of the hidden state being fed back into itself after the linear transformation and activation. This is the key concept behind RNNs. You can also unfold the RNN as multiple layers concatenated together as the diagram shows, in which state S of T minus one is fed into S of T, S of T into S of T plus one, and so on. Note that at each time step I, the RNN receives input X of I and outputs O of I. Hence, we are able to process a sequence of inputs X of 1 to X of T and also get back a sequence O of 1 to O of T from the network. RNNs are trained through an algorithm called backpropagation through time. Recall that in standard backpropagation, we are trying to compute the gradients of some error function with respect to the network parameters given many training examples. 
In this case, the network is param parametrized by the matrices U, V, and W. The error function could be something typically used like cross entropy loss. Unlike feed forward networks, the gradient at a given time step is dependent on the previous time steps because of the time dependent hidden state. We could think of this as backpropagating through multiple time steps and summing the gradients for the weight matrix W, which scales the hidden state vector S of T. Equivalently, this is the standard backprop algorithm done on the unfolded version of the RNN as depicted. You can see in the diagram that the backpropagation is done through the hidden states. The vanilla flavor of RNN and backpropagation was found to have a critical shortcoming in which it wasn't capturing long-term dependencies. This ends up being problematic for many NLP tasks in which the meaning of a sentence is often determined by words that aren't close to each other. For example, consider the sentence, the man who wore a hat on his head went inside. Semantically, the gist of the sentence is about a man who went inside, but it's unlikely a vanilla RNN can capture this information. Looking more closely at the way the gradient is computed for backprop can show this. Assume we have a simple case where the hidden state H of T is a simple function W times S of T minus one pushed through some activation. We ignore inputs in the bias for now. Consider two points in time T prime and T. You can show that the partial derivative of S of T prime with respect to S of T is given by the product on the screen. Note that the weight W scales via the expression t prime minus t. So the weight w either grows or decays exponentially fast in t prime minus t. When w is less than one, it will decay and the gradient becomes unstable. Remember that we must sum the gradients over the time steps in backpropagation through time. This means that long range dependencies are difficult for vanilla RNNs as the gradient contributions from faraway steps tend to zero. This is called the problem of vanishing gradients when W is less than one and of exploding gradients for W is greater than one. Long short-term memory networks were introduced in the 1990s to address the problem of vanishing gradients and to capture long-term dependencies. We can again imagine the LSTM unfolded into time-dependent cells. In addition to the hidden state, the LSTM introduces a cell state which flows between cells. The cell state at time step t is computed as some linear transformation on the previous cell state. The cell state can then be imagined as preserving long-term dependencies and information between cells since it is a simple affine transformation without a nonlinear activation being applied. Instead, the cell state is modified through forget, input, and output gates in each LSTM cell. Gates are essentially a sigmoid layer with a pointwise multiplication operator. We'll zoom in more closely at what each gate does. The forget gate is a sigmoid layer which outputs a value between 0 and 1 for each entry in the cell state matrix C of T minus 1. That indicates what to retain, where intu intuitively 0 means that the entry is discarded and 1 means that it's retained completely. This layer is a function of hidden state H of T minus 1 and X of T. As a concrete NLP example, the cell state might encode the gender of the current subject of the text. If the network sees a new subject, it might zero out information like pronouns, which refer to the previous subject in the cell state via the forget gate of the LSTM. The input gate is another sigmoid layer, which decides which values in the cell state C of T minus one to update. Again, it takes in H of T minus one and X of T. We also compute hyperbolic tangent of the same form to create a vector of new candidate C tilde that could be added to the state. Hyperbolic tangent or tanch effectively squashes the input between negative one and one, which gets multiplied by the output of the sigmoid layer. In the NLP example, this can be thought of, out of as adding gender of the new subject to replace the old one that the network is forgetting. To update the old cell state, the new state C of T is a linear, simple linear function of the old cell state C of T minus one and the output of tanch in the input gate. These are scaled each by the output of the sigmoid layers and summed together to create the new state C of T. The LSTM also includes an output gate in which the sigmoid layer decides which part of the cell state to output. 
Again, again, it feeds some function of H of T minus one and X of T through a sigmoid layer. The cell state is fed through a tangent layer to select output values H of T. Cumulatively, the gates allow the cyclic dependency introduced by the vanilla RNN, but still retain more persistent long distance context in the cell state. Gated recurrent units are another architecture introduced in 2014 as a simpler alternative to the LSTM. The literature has found comparable performance of LSTMs and GRUs, and occasionally GRUs are favored because of faster training times. The GRU simplifies the LSTM gates into an update and reset gate. Intuitively, the update gate determines how much of the previous memory to retain and can be thought of as a hybrid of the LSTM's forget and input gates. The reset gate determines how to combine new input with previous memory. The input to the sigmoid layers is similar as in the LSTM, but the architecture simplifies it to only two sigmoid layers. The cell state is also eliminated and everything is captured by the hidden state vector, as can be seen by the equations in the diagram. To round out this discussion of architectures, we can examine some results which evaluate each against each other. A paper from 2017 from Yin et al. did a comparative eval for a convolutional, convolutional neural network versus an LSTM versus a GRU on a set of NLP tasks. The authors examined the NLP task sentiment classification, relation classification, textual entailment, multiple choice answer selection, question relation match, path query answering, and part of speech tagging. The results are given in the table. These results show that the GRU performs best on sentiment classification and comparably with the CNN for relation classification. The GRU also outperforms the CNN on text entailment and path query answering. For part of speech tagging, a bidirectional LSTM outperforms both the GRU and the CNN. The authors note that it is expected for the RNN methods to outperform the CNN in path query answering and part of speech tagging, where long range dependencies are important. The authors also examined the potentially surprising results that the GRU outperforms the CNN on sentiment classification and relation classification. The plot on the left shows accuracy as a function of sequence length ranges. The GRU and CNN are comparable when lengths are small, but the GRU gets increasing advantage over the CNN with longer sentences. This long range advantage applies even to tasks like sentiment classification and relation classification. The authors state that, for example, in sentiment classification, a few local negative keywords like won't or miss may be used in a sentence that should be classified as having positive sentiment overall. Such examples are captured only by the GRU. I'll now introduce the PyTorch framework and show a simple example on how to construct a basic network. PyTorch is a deep learning framework released by Facebook in 2016. In PyTorch, the unit of computation is tensors, a generalization of vectors and matrices. PyTorch was novel when introduced because of the concept of a dynamic computation graph. Other deep learning frameworks like TensorFlow encode the network as a static computation graph, meaning input size must be fixed upon declaring the network. PyTorch's dynamic graph allows dynamic allocation of memory on the heap, which makes it useful for variable length input. This is a scenario commonly encountered in NLP. A critical downside to a dynamic computation graph is that it must be rebuilt after each iteration of training. The static graph in TensorFlow optimizes the training process by freezing the graph. Because of the dynamic graph, PyTorch also uses immediate eager execution, meaning that the framework runs tensor computations as it encounters them, recording only what is necessary to differentiate the computation instead of materializing a forward graph of the network. This is in contrast to TensorFlow, which specifies a static graph structure that is differentiated symbolically ahead of time and then run many times. We'll look at a very simple uh, tutorial on how to initialize a network in PyTorch. First, we import the package as torch and define some activation function. In this example, we have implemented sigmoid using PyTorch's exponential function. 
For the sake of example, we'll generate some random data to use as features, weights, and bias for the network. A seed ensures deterministic output. We next define a variable Y as matrix multiplication of the features and weights added to the bias and then push through our custom activation function. We can also stack multiple layers to achieve greater model complexity. In the example shown here, we define two hidden states in one output unit. Weights are initialized randomly for inputs to the hidden layer and from the hidden layer to the output layer. We also create bias terms for the hidden and output layers. This defines a complete small toy network. We can retrieve output from the network as follows. A hidden state H is computed as a function of W1 and B1. The output is then computed as a function of W2 and B2 and H. We can get the tensor output from the graph by printing the value of the output variable. This gives some very simple basics on how to construct basic networks in PyTorch. I'll now give two examples of training simple neural NLP models in PyTorch. I will use two tutorial notebooks published on the PyTorch website at the below links in the references. In this first no notebook, we'll be examining a simple LSTM network for part of speech tagging. Given an input sentence, we wish to determine the part of speech for each of the constituent word tokens. Here we use PyTorch LSTM object. The LSTM object takes in inputs as 3D tensors in which the first axis is the sequence itself, the second index is the mini batch, and the third index elements of the input. This code snippet shows a call to the LSTM object. In this example, the input dimension is three and the output dimension is three, fed into the LSTM constructor. When calling the LSTM constructor, we get back all of the hidden states through the sequence and the fir first return value out, as shown in this line. The second return value hidden is the most recent hidden state. This is enough to backpropagate and train the network. In this toy example, we do part of speech tagging. The training data consists of two examples, the dog ate the apple and everybody read the book, along with the sequence of part of speeches. We loop through the training data to map the part of speech tags to int indices. For this toy example, we have an embedding dimension of six and hidden dimension of six. Now we can create the model in an LSTM tagger class. In the constructor, we call the LSTM object with the embedding, embedding and hidden dimensions. We also include a linear layer, which calls the linear object to map from the hidden space to the part of speech tag space. We also define a forward function for scoring on a sentence in the class. For training the model, we first call the LSTM tagger object and define a loss function as negative log, log likelihood loss and optimizer stochastic gradient descent. In training, we go through 300 epochs for this toy example. We run the forward pass and then compute the loss gradients and update parameters by calling the optimizer.step function. After training, we can see the scores. This is the basic flow of training a network in PyTorch. Note that we don't expect good results here since we have simply gone through the flow with toy data. And we see here the output. In the next example, we train an RNN from scratch. The task here is to classify a surname by the language of origin given a set of 18 possible language of origins. Our training data is a few thousand surnames of various languages of origin. In this task, the sequence in consideration is the character sequence of names. First, we do some pre-processing 
to make sure that all Unicode strings are turned into plain ASCII. I've also downloaded the data and unzipped it beforehand with one file per language. Next, we consider each surname as a sequence of characters. To represent a single letter, we use a one-hot vector in which the vector is all zeros except for one at the index of the current letter. As with the input to the LSTM object, we need to convert these examples into 3D tensors. Here we set the second dimension, which is the mini batch size to one, so that we have each example as a tensor with dimensions line length by one by number of letters in the vocabulary. This cell shows this conversion. As with the LSTM example, we create a custom class, the RNN class. Here the RNN module is two linear layers which operate on, the, on an input and hidden state. We also take a log softmax layer after the output to get the class probabilities. The forward function takes in the input and hidden state and computes the class probabilities via forward propagation in the network. Note that we must also initialize the hidden state to a tensor of zeros. Before we write a quick helper function which extracts the most probable class. We also write functions to display a training example, meaning the name in its language. Again, we use negative log likelihood loss for the loss function. During training, we will create input and target tensors. We initialize the uh, hidden state to zero. We then read in each character sequentially and keep a hidden state for the next letter. We compare the final output to the target. Finally, we backpropagate based on the loss function and we also return the output and loss to see intermediate progress during training. We are ready to run with some examples. Note that we print the time required to process each training example. We will check back on the network. Uh, when, once it has finished training. As you can see with the first example, the predicted, uh, the predicted value of the language, French does not match the actual label Scottish. We can now see that the network has finished training uh, with given uh, predictions compared against the actual labels. Uh, now we are ready to plot uh, the results. First, we can inspect the loss curve for the training to see that it decreases. To evaluate results, we define an evaluate function, which is custom defined in using the rnn.init hidden function. We also plot a confusion matrix, which for every language indicates the language that the network has guessed. We can see in the confusion matrix that bright spots indicate in which uh, indicates when the language guesses incorrectly, when it is off the main diagonal. For example, Spanish and Italian are confused as are Chinese and Korean. We also define a function predict for doing inference on custom user input. We can run this through three sample inputs. Further exploration of these code examples can be seen in the PyTorch website, as well as additional tutorials.
Thanks all for your attention during this talk. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me by email. Hi, this is Daisy. I am going to talk about the applications of transformers on standard NLP tasks. We can divide the standard NLP tasks into natural language understanding tasks and the natural language generation tasks. Natural language understanding tasks break down the human language into machine readable format. The output is usually categorical information. Like in text classification, the output is the topic of the text, be it politics, sports, or entertainment. Natural language generation outputs text. In translation, the input might be English text and the output can be French equivalent. In summarization, the input might be multiple paragraphs of news and the output is the headline or the key points. In academia, researchers have been using different benchmarks to evaluate their models. GLUE is one of the most popular benchmarks. We have seen BERT, Robata, and T5 at the top of the leaderboard of the GLUE. GLUE stands for General Language Understanding Evaluation. It includes a group of tasks, datasets, and an online platform to submit, evaluate, and compare their model results. In GLUE, there are three types of tasks. The first one, single sentence classification task. For example, in the movie review dataset, the sentiment task is to classify a piece of review text is positive or negative. The second task is similarity and paraphrase task. The input are two segments of text. The output is how semantically these two segments are. The last task is inference task, which is to determine whether the hypothesis follows the premise or not. As the recent improvement with transformer pre-trained models on the GLUE tasks, it's hard to differentiate model performance. So a group of researchers created a new benchmark called SuperGLUE, which includes a set of much difficult tasks. The next benchmark has been widely used for question answering. Question answering the GLUE benchmark just um, determine if the answer to the question is included in the provided document. In addition to find if the question is answerable or not, SQUAD requires finding the answers in the provided document. We will see a notebook example for SQUAD in the upcoming content. Applying transformers to these standard NLP tasks is really transfer learning. In the past couple of years, we have seen tremendous improvement on the aforementioned benchmarks by transfer learning. Transfer learning reduced the amount of uh, labor data and also the amount of training needed for a specific task. Transfer learning consists of two stages, pre-training and fine-tuning. The power of transfer learning really comes from pre-training. Pre-training doesn't require any labeled data and it allows the model to learn from very large amount of data and very diverse data. The more the data the uh, model is pre-trained on, the more context information the model carries. Pre-training usually takes a lot of time and the result is a model with pre-trained weights. The second stage is fine tuning. Fine tuning is the, the adaptation um, to a pre-trained model to specific tasks. Data needed specific pre-processing usually, and also um, additional layers are added to process the output of the pre-trained um, model. Fine tuning needs to uh, figure out the most effective way to transfer uh, the learned representation to the target task. Fine tuning is usually much faster compared to pre-training. 
and it requires, of course, it requires uh, labor data, which can be scarce in some domains. Before I move to talk about the details of how to apply the transformers on the NLP task, let's talk about uh, various aspects of transformer application. Well, what I list uh, on the side is not a complete list of consideration. They are essential when you build a transformer-based NLP application. In the fine-tuning phase, the first thing we need to do is to choose a model. Of course, we need to choose a transformer model which supports the language we want to work on. We also need to be aware of what corpus have been used for pre-training. Even for the same corpus, we have to be aware of what kind of pre-training tasks uh, are used. Different constructions of the pre-training tasks can be targeted at different uh, downstream tasks and can have very different performance. The size of a model is very important. The smaller the model, the faster the fine tuning, the less resources is required for fine tuning. We will talk about the techniques to reduce a pre-trained model or techniques to compress a model. Uh, in some cases, we have to trade off the model size and quality. However, the quality on the downstream tasks largely depends on the quality of the labor data in fine tuning and also hyperparameter tuning. When applied transformers to certain domain, we should seek domain-specific training data. The main adaptation can also be achieved by using the main specific text corpus for pre-training. Hyperparameter tuning and the main adaptation through pre-training can be expensive. In the inference time, we use latency and the throughput as performance metric. Latency is the time we need to use to serve a request. Throughput is the number of requests that we can serve in a period of time. GPU skills best. Uh, with the uh, batching input. So most of the time we choose to uh, use GPU for training, but it would be too expensive to use GPU at inference time. When using CPU for inferencing, uh, we might need to set proper number of threads um, used by the PyTorch work processes. As by default, uh, each process will attempt to use um, in, in, in PyTorch model attempted to use uh, multiple cores to handle even a single inference request, which can result in stagnations when too many of these uh, workers are running at once in the same machine. Uh, we mentioned model compression to speed up training. Model compression techniques can also mm, be very useful at the inference time, uh, especially for uh, latency sensitive and the resource limited application. Dive into these considerations. When transformer yield so much advan advancement in the major languages, na major la natural languages, we have to admit that many languages hasn't been able to reap the benefit of transformers. Why? It's simply because there is no such print trained model. Take Bird as an example. Only a few languages uh, have monolingual print-trained model. Multilingual bird supports uh, up to um, top 100 languages with the largest Wikipedias. 100 sounds like a large number, but how many languages are there? Uh, according to a Washington Post uh, 2015 report, there are more than 7,000 languages. We see there is a big gap, and uh, their works uh, can be done to cover more languages. In using a multilingual um, print trained model, we need to be aware of uh, the resources that the language um, has comparatively in pre training, and uh, um, what we can do to improve model performance. We call language with very limited accessible training corpus as low resource language. Uh, we call language with relatively more abundant accessible training corpus uh, as high resource language. In pre-training a multilingual model, uh, language are competing for limited model capacity to some extent. And we also want to avoid overfitting 
um, to low resource language. So usually high resource language um, corpus will be under sampled and the low resource language corpus will be uh, over sampled. Uh, for high resource language, um, better performance can be achieved by performing more pre-training um, with the, the available um, pre-training corpus on top of the um, pre-trained multilingual model. The graph shows the size of the largest model increased exponentially in the past two years. The largest model, GPT-3, would require at least 350 gigabytes of RAM just to load the model and run inference at a decent speed. This is the equivalent of at least 11 Tesla V100 GPUs with 32 gigabytes of memory each. While it's uh, simply not affordable for most of us to use such model, it's also not necessary. One reason is that most of the time, the downstream task depends on the quality of training data and uh, hyperparameter tuning. Another reason is that there are a few model te um, compression techniques which reduce the model size significantly without losing much uh, the performance. One way of compressing uh, models is um, distillation. We have talked about uh, distillation in the past. Basically, it's knowledge distillation, sometimes also referred to as teacher-student learning, in which a small model is trained to reproduce the behavior of a larger model. Distillation can reuse the knowledge from uh, the big model by, use, by using much, much shorter time and also less resource compared to um, pre-training a smaller model from scratch, and it can also maintain good performance. For example, it still Robota reaches 95% of uh, Robota-based uh, model performance on Glue, while being twice faster and 35% smaller. Another technique is quantization. Quantization is basically approximate the weights of a network with a smaller precision. Uh, you can do quantization at the fine tuning time and also inference time. Uh, in our NLP repo, um, we use automatic mixed precision, also AMP. AMP provides four optimization level. When a non floating point 32 uh, bits optimization level is selected, the model size in memory is drastically uh, decreased. Training speed uh, is accelerated and the batch size can be increased um, for fine tuning and also for uh, inferencing. Uh, while quantized models uh, can suffer from uh, information loss, researchers have extensively uh, demonstrated that weights and activations um, can be represented at a reduced precision uh, without incurring significant loss in accuracy. Um, at the first time, uh, another um, um, quantization technique is uh, to use Arnox runtime. Arnox runtime can help accelerate the PyTorch um, TensorFlow models in production on CPU or GPU. Arnox runtime supports many popular uh, machine learning and deep neural network frameworks, including PyTorch. Um, and it's also a uh, a cross-platform accelerator. Uh, it also comes with a Docker image, uh, so switching between dev environment, uh, production environment, um, uh, when using Onus runtime uh, is seamless. Uh, let's see uh, the performance uh, of Onus uh, runtime. Um, the left side is the inference speed up of Arnox on CPU and the GPU cross bird based, both large and uh, GPT2 models. Uh, the speed up over the original PyTorch model comes from both quantization as well as acceleration by Arnox runtime. The right side is the accuracy comparison of fine tuning a bird based uh, case model from. Um, the Microsoft Research Paraphrase Corpus uh, task in glue. 
uh, inferencing in Arnold's runtime environment with quantization calls only a slight uh, performance job. Next, let's talk about a fine tuning transformer based print trained model for a standard NLP tasks. Uh, in all of these tasks, uh, we are really using transformers um, to create a meaningful uh, representation of each input token. Uh, the first uh, fine tuning task uh, is uh, uh, text classification. The problem of text classification is that uh, given a sentence or uh, paragraph of text to categorize it to a class. An example is a sentiment analysis. We determine whether a sentence is positive or negative, or we determine the category of a document. The diagram on the right side shows the proper um, processing. And the input text is tokenized, and a special class token is added to the beginning of the input token sequence. The final hidden state or the output uh, embedding uh, of the first class token uh, is used as input to a classifier. The output of the classifier is the uh, label probability. The fine tuning process is to jointly maximize the log probability of the correct label. Uh, the second uh, standard NLP task is uh, named the entity recognition. Uh, it's a um, technique to extract uh, entities uh, and classify uh, the extracted entity to uh, name the entities that's present in a text um, to predefine the categories. For example, for a set of predefined categories of for person, city, and the movie type, in the sentence of um, um, Michael Jordan of Chicago Bulls is setting a 10-hour Netflix documentary in 2019. A well-trained name entity recognizer should be able to recognize entity um, person name uh, Michael Jordan, city Chicago, and movie type of documentary. And the label the data for um, an ER uh, assumes each word has a label in the format of inside, outside, beginning tagging, also called the IOB tagging. And if a word does not belong to any of the uh, predefined category, label O is uh, given to the word. If a word's category is different from its next word, the word label will be prefixed with I. If a sequence of words belongs to the same category, and the first word uh, will have a label prefixed with B, and uh, the following words will have a label prefixed with I. The diagram on the right shows uh, how to perform the NER for uh, uh, input sequence. Different from text classification, where only the beginning class token will be classified, each token for the input sequence will be classified um, to uh, by a multi-class classifier, so token classification are not done independently. Question answering, as the name indicates, tries to find answers to a question from the provided document. There are two methods: um, generative methods and extractive methods. The extractive methods extract the answer verbatim from the provided document, while generative methods try to generate new text. Um, for the answer to answer the question, uh, we use the extractive method in our NLP repo. On the right of the side, you can see an example of extractive uh, um, question answering. The topic of the provided uh, text here is about is meteorology. Um, the answer to question directly comes from um, the provided document. When fine-tuning a print-trained model for question answering, the input um, of the question and uh, the provided document are separated by the special token step. Uh, a class token is added to the beginning of the question, indicating whether the question can be answered or not by the provided documents. For each token in, in the provided documents, uh, the model 
predicts the probability um, of uh, it being the start of the answer span and the probability of it being the end of the answer span. Um, for uh, performance evaluation, um, for question and answering, we usually uh, use uh, these two uh, metrics. The first one is exact match, uh, which measures the percentage of predictions that match any one of the grand truth answers exactly. The second one is a micro average F1 score, which treats um, prediction and the ground truth as back of the token and compute their F1. So as you can see, uh, usually exact match metrics is uh, lower than F1 score. Natural language inferencing uh, is the task of determining whether a hypothesis is true, false, or undetermined, given a promise. So in this table, I list uh, uh, one example of uh, a natural language inferencing task, which is entailment. Um, for example, based on the premise, a man inspects uh, the uniform of a figure in some Eastern Asian country. Um, for premise, uh, the man is sleeping, but it's simply um, um, force or it's contradiction to its uh, premise. Very similar to fine tuning text classification, the embedding of the class token added to the beginning of the input sequence is fed to a classifier. The difference is that the input sequence uh, here for entailment or natural language inferencing task um, includes uh, two segments, uh, which are separated by the SEP token. So we have uh, examples for um, the aforementioned uh, scenarios, and uh, we have uh, um, examples for more scenarios in our NLP uh, recipes. You can access our repo through the link provided on the slide, or simply search uh, NLP recipe. Uh, the focus of our repository are scenarios, models, and the language. With this NLP best practice repository, uh, we want to provide guidance on choice of uh, models for common NLP tasks. Uh, we also want to reduce the time from business problems to implementation to make uh, the state of art models accessible to all. We have multiple language support and uh, easy to follow examples that can serve as templates. Uh, we have examples for all the listed scenarios. We discussed the first four. Uh, for embedding, uh, it comes with the transformer encoder. We also have notebooks to evaluate the quality of embedding. Uh, sentence similarity can be considered as an extension to embedding by applying similarity metrics um, on the sentence embedding. For text summarization, uh, we have uh, extractive methods, BERSUM and the abstractive methods, mini LM, uni LM, uh, BERSUM, abstractive methods. Uh, we also have examples for um, model interpretation and the text annotation. We have included uh, um, in our repo um, some reusable data set and the data utilities and also um, I want to highlight our base fine tuning class, uh, which can be used in almost all the scenarios, uh, including text classification, na named entity recognition, question answering, entailment, and the text summarization. Um, uh, our, fine uh, our base class allows uh, a lot of fine tuning customization. Um, you can use uh, mixed uh, precision and training. Uh, it also supports uh, uh, distributed uh, uh, training. Um, it support, supports almost uh, uh, all the transformer models from Hugging Face, and it allows uh, setting different uh, uh, optimizer and the learning schedule. And also, uh, it allows uh, adding a validation fun uh, function during fine tuning. Let's uh, uh, review some of the notebooks in our NLP uh, recipes repo. 
So you can access the repo from the link list here. It's github.com slash Microsoft slash NLP dash recipes. So here um, you can look into the readme for vessel information, uh, like the overview and um, the focus area and the scenarios and uh, the language support it has. Um, to get started, you can uh, navigate to the setup guide, which is the um, setup markdown file. So here uh, it listed um, um, a bunch of uh, supported computing environment and uh, how to uh, create a cloud-based workstation and also how to uh, set up a local or virtual uh, machine environment. Um, uh, some of the details that are notable are like how to set up the dependencies. Um, uh, we have utilities, uh, which is the generate conda file that you can create a conda environment um, based on the uh, argument. You can create a CPU environment and you can create a G GPU environment. For the Python GPU environment, um, we have detailed instructions of how um, you can install from um, scratch or you can um, do upgrade. And uh, we also have uh, optional instructions on how to enable the mixed precision training. And uh, we also have uh, troubleshooting um, instructions. Um, next, we are going to talk about uh, um, the uh, notebooks. Before we talk about the notebooks, uh, I want to talk about the utils on LP. So basically, there are two uh, folders that's uh, relevant to this tutorial. The first one is examples. Um, this is where all the note notebook locates. So we have notebooks for almost uh, all the aforementioned scenarios. And in Utils NLP, um, we have utilities um, for uh, various uh, uh, scenarios. Um, uh, so we have utilities in Azure ML. So this is the utilities to uh, use Azure Machine Learning Service for training. So with Azure Machine Learning Service, you can start or demand a um, GPU cluster to run in training with low cost. So in common, we have utils for like timer and the PyTorch. Um, and in data set, we have utilities to download and process the common data set like uh, BBC Hindi um, for text classification, CN Daily Mail for text summarization, etc. And we also have eval utilities. So these are the scripts to evaluate uh, various tasks. Um, like sentence eval for evaluating the quality of embedding. Rouge, uh, is, this folder is using evaluating summarization and uh, et cetera. And in models, we have transformers. So in um, transformers, we have uh, uh, the base class in common.py. We have uh, several data sets class uh, in data sets.py. And we have um, a few uh, uh, abstractive summarization classes and uh, extractive summarization classes. And um, also, for text classification, we have a sequence classification. And for named entity recognition, we have a token classification. And for question answering, we have Q&A classes. Um, let's review uh, the base class in common.py. So um, we build uh, our NLP repo on top of uh, on Hugging Faces transformers. Um, um, so um, here we actually imported the um, optimizer and the uh, scheduler. So um, the optimizer is really to minimize the loss between the prediction and the, the label uh, through the network. And um, 
here. Um, and so we are uh, using uh, learning rates, uh, um, also learning schedule and warm up. So let me explain these um, uh, terms. So learning rate is the step size uh, we um, update the gradient of the um, we use the gradient to update the weights of the network, and uh, the scheduler schedules um, um, the change of the learning rates. And the warm up is a technique to um, reduce the instability. Um, so what warm up does is uh, to um, in the beginning of uh, training, uh, you start with uh, uh, a much smaller learning rate than your target learning rate. And then you increase the, uh, over the next uh, few uh, iterations until it reaches the um, target learning rate. Um, and uh, uh, so here um, we import um, uh, some utilities from the PyTorch utils, which is uh, um, get amp um, device uh, and uh, move the model to device and parallel to motor models. So these are the steps we um, actually uh, use in preparing the model um, uh, and uh, also the optimizer. Um, I will talk about it in when we talk about the um, function. So uh, here's the base um, class for fine tuning. So the name is also transformer. And you can initiate the transformer with the model name and the desired model and the caching directory. Um, while we allow customization um, for using different optimizers, we provide this default optimizer. So, um, so um, that's the um, like uh, that's the class the optimizer we imported from Hacking Faces the uh, transformer library. And similar to optimizer, we provide a um, default scheduler, and of course you can use uh, um, different scheduler in fine tuning. So we have uh, customization uh, in the fine tuning function. And here is the prepare model and optimizer. So um, this is the uh, uh, what we learned uh, uh, the right way to um, prepare the models and the optimizers. So basically, you have to perform these four steps in order. So uh, it's recommended to uh, move the model to the GPU devices before you create an optimizer. And uh, the model and the optimizer will be fed into the initialization function for AMP. And after all this, uh, you can parallelize the model for distributed training. Um, one thing to note here is that uh, um, when you save the uh, um, checkpoint, um, so you need to um, actually save uh, the checkpoint for optimizer, uh, also the model. And uh, if you use um, mixed precision training, you have to uh, also save the amp state. So here's the fine tuning function. So here's the, all the um, customizations we allow. Um, in the uh, uh, with the tra train data loader, you decide what kind of uh, data you are used for fine tuning, and the get inputs is actually um, um, prepare the uh, a function, and it's actually uh, prepare the inputs for the fine tuning class, and device and uh, decide whether you want to use GPU or CPU in a um, what types are they? And also you can decide the number of GPU use, the max steps you want to fine tune. Um, global steps is really an um, uh, argument to reuse the saved checkpoint. Uh, you want to have a, a step that associated with uh, the checkpoint. Um, and here you can set the max gradient norm and um, gradient accumulation. So uh, our fine tuning function also allows a gradient accumulation. Um, a gradient accumulation is a technique to increase the batch size. So um, with the limited uh, uh, resource like uh, GPU memory, you may not fit uh, the desired uh, batch size of uh, the input data into the memory. So you can use um, increase the gradient accumulation steps to uh, increase the batch size. 
Um, the next one is the optimizer. Um, so we mentioned by default it's none and uh, it will use the default uh, uh, optimizer. And same for scheduler. Um, here is the um, parameters related to mixed precision training. And local bank is a um, parameter related to distributed training. And the verbose, um, if you set verbose true, you will see um, uh, outputs of uh, um, some log information. And the state is uh, the random state you uh, put for this training. And uh, report and save is really related to um, uh, how much uh, uh, information you want to get. Like a report will actually report um, um, the information uh, every a uh, few um, batches and also save every will save um, the um, the model the the model that's being trained um, uh, every few um, batches and also uh, you can decide uh, whether you want to clip the gradient the norm um, so it's really uh, this parameter deals with the exploding gradient uh, problem and also we can provide a validation function um, to see the performance of the trained model on your validation data set. So let's look into the fine-tune function. So we initialize the training, so make the model is trainable and we also want to set the gradient of the model to zero. And then um, we have some time information that uh, we use uh, to report how far along the way that the training has been going. And uh, here we uh, use the get input function to prepare the batch. And uh, we pass the input through the model, we get the output. And the first element of the output is the loss. And if we use uh, um, multiple GPU, we will um, use the mean of the loss to do back propagation. And here is the magic of the gradient accumulation. So um, the loss will be um, averaged by the um, gradient accumulation step. And uh, for mixed precision, we also do uh, scale the back um, propagation. And if it's not, we do the normal back propagation. So the loss is uh, accumulated. Um, also, we here we get the um, uh, batch size. So the batch size uh, is in the input, and uh, it's actually determined uh, by the uh, train data loader. Here, um, here are the operations we only do um, per gradient accumulation steps. Um, here we clip the norm if needed, and we report uh, at every report number of batches, and um, we update the optimizer. Uh, every uh, accumulate gradient accumulation steps. And same for uh, changing the learning rate. And uh, same for uh, setting the gradient to zero. So we also um, can save um, the model every few uh, desired number of um, um, training steps. Um, in the last, we release the GPU memory. Um, next, let's review um, the, the text classification notebook. So here, uh, we use a multi-language dataset to demonstrate uh, um, the multi-language support of uh, transformer models. So here, um, you can see we uh, actually imported the sequence classification um, model 
for fine tuning. Then also in the data set, we imported uh, three data set. The first one is the multi-genre uh, NLI, uh, natural language inferencing corpus in English. The second one is uh, DAC data set. It's a data set for Arabic classification. And the third one is the BBC Hindi news um, corpus. So here uh, we listed uh, a few um, benchmarks on running time. Um, you can see, um, um, so if you choose a quick run, um, the running time is more uh, affordable. And also there's notes on um, uh, if you run into CUDA out of uh, memory error, uh, you can try to reduce batch size and uh, reduce um, the max uh, length, the max input length in the configuration. So in this uh, notebook, um, uh, it choose to uh, use uh, DAC. And uh, the sequence classifier uh, has a function uh, which is the least supported models. So these are all the models that's supported by uh, the sequence classifier. And there are 40 of them. And here are the configurations uh, for running this notebook. So um, you can choose the local um, path to store on the data. And uh, uh, test fraction is uh, the uh, train test split. Uh, fraction for the data set. And this uh, train sample ratio, test sample ratio is really for um, the quick run. So if you choose to quick run, it will only sample um, um, the data set to um, this ratio for fine tuning. And the model, uh, we choose to use a uh, bird based multilingual case model to demonstrate the multi-language power. Uh, also, the data set is uh, DAC, so we really need to choose the multilingual data uh, model. Um, so here, uh, we assume we have two GPUs to use. So if you don't have, you can um, set this at zero or none. So if CUDA is available, um, the batch size is reset to 32. And these are used um, when we created the um, data loader. So here, um, for each data set, we actually have a specific um, uh, uh, data loading function. Um, we'll, we, we'll look into uh, the DAC one later. So here, um, uh, through the configuration, it uh, find the um, data set, uh, load data set function. And uh, also, um, it takes all these arguments. So let's uh, take a look at the, this function in the DAC data set. So here is the, here's the function to load the text classification data set. And uh, we uh, um, we read the um, data frame and we uh, encode the label, and then we split the data set into train data frame and test data frame. We perform uh, sampling on the train and test uh, data frame, and here this processor is. Um, the processor from sequence classifier. And this process has a function um, data set from data frame, which create a data set, a child class of uh, torchutil.data data set. So we will take a look at that later. And also it uh, this um, use the data loader from data set function to create, uh, create a data loader. Um, so here's the processor. So 
it had this general get inputs function which create the input from the batch. And you can see the batch is really the input um, IDs, attention mask, and the label. And also it had this test transform function. So this um, test transform we transform uh, the test for sequence classification method. So this is uh, um, the preparation for all the tokens um, to fit into the um, transformer encoder. And we can see um, the class token is added and the separate token is added um to the beginning and the end so um so with this data uh, loader um which really provides the information that the model needs so let's take a look at the model um oh sorry the fine tuning um, class so this is the fit function for the sequence classifier what we have here um, is really um, what we have covered in the base um, class. So um, this is a relatively simple uh, task. So um, many of the steps we already have abstracted into the base class. So what this field function needs is just to uh, use the base class function. So first it prepare the model and the optimizer, and then and it computed the training steps um, based on the number of epochs and uh, also the set the max steps so we want to we don't want to um, uh, exceed the max number of steps if we set the number of epochs and here we also uh, take the um, gradient uh, accumulation steps into consideration and then we created a default uh, scheduler and then we run the fine tuning with the by using reusing the base class fine tune function. So um, after loading the data set, we have the train data loader and the test data loader and the label encoder and the test labels. And then we run the fit function, which we have just discussed. And you can see uh, for this um, DAG data set, when um, quick run is true, it takes uh, still quite some time. And then we run the evaluation. So we basically use the trained model to predict um, on the test data set. And do, do remember that uh, we also support a multi-GPU prediction and then um, we use um, the classification report from the classification utilities uh, evaluation utilities and we see this the uh, performance so which is uh, really good across um, these classes next we review uh, the named anti-recognition notebook so here's some summary um, basically we're trying to use the transform models to predict the label of each token. And here uh, from the uh, utils and LP, we import the token classification processor and the token classifier. And here's some information of um, running time for this task. And also, if you see um, code out of memory error, you can reduce the batch size and the uh, max uh, sequence input length. So uh, we start from um, downloading the data set. So here uh, we use the Wikigo data set, and here's the link for the Wikigo data set. And we download the one with the uh, kernel format. And we choose to use the model bird base case. And here uh, we download the data set. We read the kernel format. So let's take a look at uh, what kernel format is. So 
uh, in our uh, data set utility uh, in neriutils.py. Um, we have uh, an example of what is a kernel format, and um, we have the pre-processing function to read the kernel format. And then we perform um, train test splits, and we show our example of what's being read into the data frame. And if your data is unlabeled, um, you can try to use the uh, annotation tool to simplify the labeling process. So we have an example um, uh, in our repo um, to use the kana um, for NER annotation. So next, we use the token classification processor to pre-process the data. So we create the uh, label map first and then pre-process the data. Let's take a look at uh, how the pre-processing is done. So here is the pre-processing function. So it's inside the named entity recognition.py. And uh, these are the steps that are performed for pre-processing. So first we need to do word piece tokenization, and then we convert the string tokens to token ID. And then we convert the input label to label ID if labels and label map are provided. And then if a word is tokenized into multiple pieces, uh, we need to uh, relabel them. Um, uh, we label the uh, first uh, um, piece, um, the subword as uh, the original label and uh, label the trailing ones or the um, subsequential um, subword with the training piece tag. And then we pad the um, or truncate the input text according to mask sequence length. And then we create the input mask for masking out the padded tokens. So, um, so let's look at what's the returns. So um, this really reveals the information of uh, what has been done. So uh, it returns the input ID, input mask. So um, basically um, the input, uh, if it's an uh, input token, uh, the mask is the uh, one. And, and if um, if it's padded token, the mask is zero. And then we have this uh, training token mask O. So um, if it's a, a sub word and it's not the first piece, we will um, mask as one. So to uh, differentiate from the uh, first uh, word piece. And then we have the label ID O. which um, um, with all these, we will uh, input to the model. Um, and uh, after we created the um, data set with the, the pre-process function, uh, we create the data loader and this data loader uh, has all the information that the um, fine tuning function needs. So before we train, uh, uh, we need to create the token classifier, and then we run the fit function. So the fit function um, uh, is uh, also um, very similar to the test classification. Um, fine tune function, so fit function. So um, yeah, these are the uh, all the um, reusable functions that we can um, put for um, into this fit function. And then um, this uh, this fit function uh, runs relatively fast. Um, after um, fitting, we run prediction on the test uh, data set. And uh, uh, we also need to um, do some post-processing because um, the um, token um, are 
uh, split into subwords, and we need to recover all those information, and then uh, we get the predicted labels, and uh, we compare it with the true label, and we get the um, result report. Um, and let's see a scoring example. So the sample text is, is it true for that Jane works at Microsoft? The second one, as you can see here, and the sample output uh, are like this. So um, these are, um, of n are not in any category. And then for Jane, we have this uh, person label. And the Microsoft, we have um, the organization label. That's it. So let's review question answering on squad data set using transformer models. So here uh, we list the information uh, for running this notebook. Um, so uh, the running time for question answering is relatively long compared to um, token classification and uh, um, text classification. Now also, uh, it uses quite some GPU memory. So if you run into CUDA out of memory error, you can try to reduce the per GPU batch size, uh, which is the batch size uh, uh, on a single GPU, and also increase the gradient accumulation step. So as long as the multiplication of the per GPU batch size and the gradient accumulation steps and the same, uh, you basically have the same batch size. So uh, we set the quick run to force uh, in this example. Um, next, we import the answer extractor and the QA processor from the utility NLP. And uh, we can list the supporting models for uh, the answer extractor. So in addition to these basic ones, we see um, the new type, uh, which is bird large on case, the whole word masking. So instead of um, uh, masking a token in the pre-training tasks, uh, it masks the whole word, may, which may consist of multiple word pieces. And you can also see um, the fine-tuned models. So if you load this, you uh, don't need to uh, fine tune on squat, and also it can um, achieve decent performance. Um, so the model we choose is both large case whole word masking. And here are the um, parameters we need to set for fine tuning. And um, we note on this uh, dog stride, which is uh, the sliding window size for creating uh, multiple um, paragraphs if uh, the input um, context uh, or document is very long. So you need to split them to create multiple uh, features for the for QA example. And next, we need to load the data. So here is an example for squad data set. So you have a context you have text and you have question. So for this example, the question, the answer to the question is um, uh, in the provided context. So this question is answerable. And then, so uh, we use the utilities from data set utils um, to uh, load the data set. Uh, here you can see the example of the loaded data set. Uh, it consists doc text, um, question text, answer start, answer text, and uh, the ID, and also whether the question is answerable or not. And then um, we do um, pre-processing of this uh, data for um, Q&A task. So we use the QA process process function. So um, the steps involved are tokenization, convert character-based answer span indexes 
to token-based indexes. And truncate the question token list if it's longer than the max question length. Also split the paragraph into multi-segments. So that's uh, uh, where the doc stride comes in. And also um, add special tokens, pad the sequence, and convert the token to token indexes. So this step is relatively involved. Um, if you're interested, you can look into um, the code to see um, how it's been performed. <clears throat> so we pre-process the data and create a data loader and uh, we create an instance of answer extractor and then we run the fit function. Um, and after we fine tune the model, we use the trained model to run prediction on the dev test, dev test, um, dev te data set. And uh, after that, um, we can see and um, the prediction uh, really just uh, output the probability of each token being the start and end of the answer span. So um, quite heavy post-processing is required to extract the real answer. Um, so let's see some examples. So for this paragraph and this question, so we have a ground truth answer here and also the predicted answer. So um, to, uh, it's predicted correctly. Mm. And also you can review the top and best answers. And the way you can run evaluation on the dev data set. So we see for Bert large case, the whole word masking, the performance is uh, the best. And we can compare it with the leaderboard for a squad. So it's uh, it exceeds the human performance on F1 score and uh, very close to the human performance on the exact match score. So we are going to be going over a few of the notebook. Before we get to the notebooks, I want to spend a few moments going over a, of some slides that introduce us to what the notebooks are going to be doing. And that just helps us to like build the story, a com more complete story around what we're trying to achieve by creating this end-to-end -end examples. My colleagues have actually explained in detail what BERT is, what transformers are, what um, BERT sum is, We've talked about what text summarization is. The first example that we're going to be going over is going to be abstractive summarization notebook that uses Birdsum. And the notebook just uh, demonstrates how you can leverage our tools and um, fine tune Bert for abstractive summarization. So all of the examples that we're going to be showing you today will be done on the CNN Daily Mail. Abstracted summarization using Birdsum apps would be our first notebook that we're, that we're going to be going over. The next notebook we're going to be going over would be abstracted summarization using UniLM. So UniLM is a different state-of-the-art model that was developed by Microsoft mm -hmm. Research in Asia, pre-trained on the large, on the entire English Wikipedia and the book corpus. So the advantage we get from this large uh, models and being pre-trained on a large corpus of text is that we can fine tune it on different NLP tasks. So for example, we can fine tune a uh, UniLM on text classification, but in this case, we are going to be fine tuning it on abstractive summarization. So the next example that we are going to be talking about would be abstractive summarization as well, but with a slightly different model from UniLM. So UniLM as a large model, can get too big and you can't use it for more, like production systems that that gave birth to mini lm using knowledge distillation so the benefit we can get from uni lm is getting the same performance or almost the same performance as we can get from uni lm mini lm now becomes is now 10 times faster at training and six times faster at inference than uh, uni lm 
it's trained to deeply mimic the UniLM deep self attention. And so technically it's trained to mimic um, the self attention layers here. But then the parameters are reduced way um, so, so that we can get faster training and inference times. So after this, we would have one more notebook that we, be go that we are going to be going over, which would be the extractive summarization notebook using the transformer version of Birdsum. So we're not going to go into detail talking about Birdsum anymore, but this is just to show you that Birdsum apps can be used for both abstracted and extracted type of summarization. This is the Birdsum uh, extraction architecture. Uh, the figure here just illustrates how Birdsum can be can can be can be fine tuned for extractive summarization task. So the CLL token is inserted into the beginning of each sentence, also the SEP at the end. So interval segments, embeddings, and the positional embed embeddings are added upon the token embedding as the input of the BERT model. We have this representation at this point where we now start finding useful sequences in the input text. The summarization layer predicts the probability of each sentence being included in the summary. We leverage techniques like the trigram block in here to find if a sequence, if a sentence is going to be useful in generating a summary. So one other notebook that I will show you, but won't, I don't think we're gonna get to running that just because of the added uh, resources that we need would be the extra, uh, it would be distributed, uh, distributed summarization using Azure ML. I'll show you the notebooks. You have the link so you can always try it, but for this, you need the prerequisites. You need to have an Azure subscription you need to have um, access to Azure Machine Learning Workspace and the SDK. So once you get to the root of the directory, you just click on summarization, you, cl you click on examples, you click on examples, and then you scroll to the bottom, you would see the other scenarios that we've covered before, that we haven't covered before, but I've shown you that we covered these other scenarios. And, but then you see text summarization here. And then if you click into text summarization, there's a nice readme here that tells you exactly what we're trying to do. So it tells you that this folder um, contains examples of best practices for text summarization using state-of-the-art transformer-based models. It also tells you that the utilities that we use in these examples can be found in the utils underscore NLP. So once you pip install this repo into your own environment, you get all the utilities that we've developed in the utils NLP. And later on, I will show you what is what, what to expect in that utils NLP folder. So um, we'll just talk about what text summarization is. And it tells you that we are going to be covering two types of text summarization, the extractive and the abstractive. And something else that it tries to show, it says that, okay, we'll try to group these, uh, these examples based on the type of summarization that we're trying to achieve. So one will be the abstractive summarization, extractive, and then we have a common folder for the evaluation of the scores. The, uh, this table just gives you a nice overview of the examples that we have and tells you what the groupings are. So the first four are going to be the abstractive, and then the last two would be for the extractive. Next, we'll jump into the examples and start running them. So the first example that we're going to be running today is the abstractive summarization using Birdsum apps using the CNN Daily Mail dataset here. So just like the slides that I showed earlier, the notebooks are designed in a way to make someone who has little to no experience in NLP to just pick it up and help you get started. So it goes over like trying to explain what abstractive summarization is, which we've seen. It goes into telling you a bit about about what the Birdsum app is. So this there's going to be a reference to the paper that the published examples and the CNN Daily, Daily Mail data sets. There's an architecture diagram as well. So the interesting thing here is that since the DNN Daily CNN the CNN Daily Mail data set is really large. So what we've done is we've provided a flag called Quick Run. And if you set this flag to true, what it does is it tries to subset your data into a smaller data set so that you can quickly run the example and just get quick root scores and move on and that helps you just to see how the notebook works and to see if it's suitable for what exactly that you're trying to do so for this for all the examples we're going to be setting quick run 
to true. Another advice is to run this examples, uh, to run these examples on GPU enabled machines uh, because it's just very computationally expensive. So like it says here, it, this notebook takes about five hours to run on a VM that has four 16 gigabytes NVIDIA V100 GPUs. And the fine tuning costs about 1.5 hours. So an hour and a half and inference costs about 3.5 hours. So for better performance, you want to increase like the max steps, which we're going to see here. But for the fact that we have quick run set to true, this notebook is going to be pretty quick to run. You can just get results. We're just going to start running the cells one by one, and I will describe what's happening as we go from top to bottom. So here we just set in quick run to true. And then at this point, you can see that we are calling certain utilities from utils underscore NLP. So for the models, for the abstracted, we will be importing like Bertram apps and the Bertram apps processor. Uh, we also have described like the CNN Daily Mail. We we have a wraparound that, that helps us process the CNN Daily Mail for summarization task. So that's what we have here. We have it defined here. We also under the transformer data sets, we have uh, utilities that make it easy to inter to interact with um, a summarization style data set. So we have that also defined here as well. So we let's just run this first cell so, so we can get all our dependencies in. It'll take about a, it should be done soon. Okay, so we've run this and we have all our imports. So the next thing we want to do is go down and process our data. So the data processing step here, we have a description to say, okay, the data set that we're going to be using in this notebook is going to be the CNN Daily Mail data set. And it contains, it tells you what the data set contains. It contains documents and accompanying questions from the news articles of CNN and Daily Mail. Um, so the highlights in each article are used as summaries. So we have like the highlights and then we have the documents. So we want to generate some summary for that. So the data set consists of about 289,000 training examples and about 11,000 validation examples with another 11,000 um, test examples. And each of the news article is about 781 tokens and on average. And the summaries are of 3.75 sentences, so almost four sentences long for each summary that we generate. And each summary has 56 tokens on, a, on average as well. So a significant uh, part of the data processing as well is how we can split the document into sentences. With um, the data, what we want to do now is to create a train data set and a test data set using uh, one of the utilities that will build that takes that downloads this in a daily mail for you, does the pre-processing and the cleaning, and then does the splitting as well based on the parameters that you pass into this class. So the next step we're going is to describe what our fine tuning parameters are going to be. So here we create a cache path as well, which is just going to be a temporary directory where we want to checkpoint our model as we are in the training process. If you wanted to do mixed precision training, you would need to set F, FP16, but we don't have that set up, so we're going to leave it as, as false right now. So we want to calculate how many GPUs we have on the machine, and then with that, calculate an appropriate batch size to fit the size of that machine. We define what our learning rates would be. Uh, let's see. So we want to report results after every 10 steps, and we want to save after every 500 steps. Well, we're creating a processor here, and then based on that processor, we pass it into our Bertram app uh, model. So let's just run this. So at this point, I think we're ready to fit our model. The summarizer here exposes a function called fit, and it also exposes a function called predict. So we're going to be using that to fit the model. At this point, we're done fitting the data to the model. The next thing we want to do is to save that model to our cache path. The next thing we need to do is to evaluate our model. So as you can see, we've also told you what to expect as well. So to run the evaluation, uh, 
there's a section of that you can compute the root score. So for the settings in this notebook, um, with quick run equals to false, which is the large one, you should get results that are um, similar to this. And if you wanted like better performance, you would just um, set your max steps to a larger value than you currently have. The summary data set as well exposes a method called shorten that helps you shorten the, um, the, the amount that you want to be testing on as well. So we just run this and we're generating the summary at this point because we're calling summarizer the predict with our test and with our, with our shortened data set. So we are done predicting. We want to see the first source uh, input text that we put in. So this was the first one. It's a lot of text. So we have this as the input. So next we want to see the generated summary. So we run this. So now let's see what the root scores would look like. So we see the root scores, uh, this we would expect it to be better if we trained it on all of the text. So most of the mismatch that we see here is because we just took a sample of a sample of the all of the data sets. So I would encourage you if you're trying out this light, this notebook sets your quick run to false and just have it train on the entire data set. The performance will be way better than this. All right, so that brings us to the end of this notebook, abstractive summarization Bertram. So it's the steps are very intuitive. We've uh, created the utility for summarization. Uh, we've created utilities that handles the CNN Daily Mail and sets them up for summarization tasks. You don't have to worry about downloading the data. Just once you have this, we do the downloading for you. We do the cleaning, the processing, and then we do the data um, feature extraction and all of that. We, we handle that for you using the utilities. All you have to do is just to use this in your pipeline and you should be good to go. So this is the second notebook that we talked about is the abstractive summarization using UniLM on CNN Daily Mail. So just like we talked about in the um, Virtsum version, we still need to set the uh, quick run to true. So like the uh, first abstracted one, what we are doing here as well is we talk about the summary as well. We describe a little bit about the model and then we'll talk about the architecture of the model. We define the input parameters and the import statements that we need so here, just like we did in the uh, Bertsum, we still leverage the CNN Daily Mail summarization data set class that we've set up in our repo. We've also set up things around like the S, the sequence to sequence abstractive sum processor, and we have the sequence to sequence abstractive uh, summarizer as well. So these are all utilities that we created to make it easy for you to leverage these models in your pipeline so like before we're also using the summarization data set as well that would define and these are all transformer pytorch based the next thing we want to do is we want to set the training parameters as well so just like before if the quick run is set to true we want to take only the first 100 i want to set at this point will be five max steps will be 50 we set up all of all of what we need so if, for example, we don't have GPUs, we want to now drop it to from 100 to top five and set the max steps to 10. In this case, our learning rate is set to three exponential negative five. And we don't have FP16 for mixed, uh, mixed precision training setup. So we set that to false. So we set up the parameters. So the next thing we want to do is now load, just like we did before, is to also is to load the CNN Daily Mail. And I've described this before. We set in the CNN Daily Mail summarization data set takes in a, a path and the number of data that we want to use. So 
<coughs> excuse me. So at this point, it's just going to be 100 each. So we have that set up. So what this is doing, it's, it's going and downloading the CNN Daily Mail from the internet, comes down, does the pre-processing, unzips it, like we can see here. It's got the CNN Daily Mail zip. It's internally unzipping it, doing the pre-processing for you. It's doing all the cleanup and it would eventually split it into a train and test data set. So we'll just give this one minute to run. So the next thing we want to do is process our data. So the sequence to sequence abstractive sum processor has multiple methods for converting input data into a summarization data set. So we run this to get a processor. So that's done. So the next thing what we want to do is to set up the environment where we want our cache features to be. And then the next thing that we're doing is we are from our, pre our processor, we're getting our train and test data sets. So we're just going to go ahead and run this. What we want to do next is to fit the model. <clears throat> so at this point, we're trying to fine tune the model. There's a little bit more information here as well that the sequence to sequence abstractive summarizer loads a pre trained uni uni model by model name. And then we call, if we call the list supported models, it tells you all the models that are supported to see. And then if you want to see, if you want to use the model on local disk, all we have to do is just say load model from directory and the, and the model name, and it should be able to load that. So next thing we want to get is an abstractive summarizer, right? So we run this cell. So the model name, if you remember, it's from the top is going to be it's UniLM. So we are downloading a pre-trained UniLM model. We're setting up all that we need to set up and ready for the model to be fit. So the fine tuning should not take as long as the other one, but we'll just give it a couple of minutes to churn through and return the results. Okay, so it seems like it's done. So this was pretty quick. So next thing we want to do is generate summaries on the testing data set. And mind you, so the whole purpose of this is not the accuracy of the generated text, it's just to show you how to do it using a very small sample of our data set. At this point, we're just running our predictions using our, data, our test sets on the model that we've just fine tuned. We're done predicting. Next thing we want to do is we want to go through and see the predictions that we return. So maybe we can reuse this to just the top two instead of the top 100 to just make it read. So these are the predictions that we got. So this makes a lot of sense to be summary that we've gotten. And then the ICC is a step towards greater justice and peace. So what we want to see from the test source, we want to see, um, we want to see the first sequence from the test data set. That's where that is gotten from. So now we check the target as well for that first and we see this as well. So we're talking about Lufthansa and then train school. So this is the target. And then the prediction is the German wings fly crash into the crash site. So also like the same thing with the um, Bertram example, we need to train it with a lot more data. So we just took a sample, we just took like a hundred samples to train this. So it's not enough data to really perform like excellently, but it's doing a great job. So this shows you how you can actually use these tools in summarization. Again, just try with a single example, a single new example, and see how it, well it does with that single new example. We'll predict on that example as well. And we just run the last cell to see what example, what that example, what we were able to abstract from the input text that we have here, So, which is pretty good. So the evaluation, so we provide utility functions by evaluating summarization models and details can be found, like I said, in that summarization evaluation notebook as well. So if we have the full data sets, we expect ROOCH1, ROOCH2, and L scores to be in this range. 
So let's just see how well the model performed with just a little data. So, but it's interesting that the whole purpose of this example, this exercise is to show you how to use this. Feel free to take these notebooks and, and fine tune on the full CNN Daily Mail text. Uh, you should see better results. So for distributed training as well, we just talk about what we can do and point you to the example that does this as well. We have a setup for UniLM doing it on the distributed framework. There's a Python script that you can download and run, which is in the repo as well, so you can use that. So next thing we want to do is to we want to save uh, the data set to JSON lines as well. So here we go ahead and try to clean up what we've done, and then we just print a summary to see how long this entire ex exercise took us. So 914 seconds. So that's the end of this particular notebook. Okay, so this is the third notebook that we're going to be going over today. Um, it's gonna be using MiniLM this time for abstractive summarization. So like before, we're just gonna go ahead and we've talked about a quick run. And the next thing we wanna do is to import all our, the dependencies we need to run the notebook. We set up the same type of parameters. So here we're gonna be using MiniLM on case. In this example, we have the same thing about a max steps being set just based on that quick run flag. You can feel free to update these numbers if you have like a bigger machine. Just for the sake of the machine that we have, I think these settings are quite right for us. So we run that cell to set the parameters. This is done. So the next thing, like as usual, is to load the data. We're just gonna load the same data sets. There we go. So the next thing we wanna do is the pre-processing. The same thing here is we pre-process the data and then build a uh, train and test data sets using our processor. So here is an example code to load pre-process uh, data from the UniLM repo. It points to an external repo for, from the UniLM, which they give us example train and test data set. So if you want to leverage that, you can use this. We expose a, a, a few other like functions, data set from JSON or file, so you can set a path to that and it should be able to pull that data in. So since that's done, we will skip on ahead and fine tune the model. I think it's good to look at the supported models that the sequence to sequence abstractive summarizer supports. So uses all of these as um, the initial checkpoints. And so there's mini LM and there's uni LM. So you have a variety of models out of the box that you can get by just using our utility. So for this case, we're just gonna be using on case mini LM get our summarizer and once we get the summarizer here what we want to do next would now be to take a look at the model and look at all the embeddings so we see that the, the mini lm actually it's fine-tuned off like the birth for sequence sequence as well and then it shows you all the weights all the layers so you can take a look and see um, what's there and then maybe go to the last layer to see how it was you know modified for this case as well what we want to run at this point is to fit our model yeah, so at this point, we are done with the prediction. Let's see the first two predictions we got from MiniLM. The reason why the predictions are not that great is simply the same thing. We don't have enough data to train the model. So here we still just um, save the file and then we can go ahead and run this like we did before on just one example. Then we predict on that example to get the results for that example. And then we see what the uh, prediction is. So for evaluation, it tells you that if you trained on the full data set, you should expect root scores of this, but I'm sure we're not gonna get that because of the size of data we used. So it's gonna be way low. We can also do the same distributed training. We can see that in the notebook that is linked here as well, which is pretty much the same thing. We uh, we call a Python script that use the distributed data parallel from PyTorch. So one last thing we need to do here is just to clean up and then, so we just check this, we check our running time and see it's about 1,540 seconds that this took. So yeah, so this is the end of this uh, notebook, the abstractive summarization using MiniLM. So you can find this notebook and run the examples, but just try and change the quick run to false so it can train longer and learn more representations and create better summaries. This is the end of the presentation. The notebooks, like I said, are under here. So we've grouped them into the extractive, 
abstractive. So we group them all into abstractive, uh, extractive, and under extractive we have the uh, AML version. So this is the notebook that goes over how to create the AML workspace. And then this is the script that you run. So same thing with the abstractive as well. We talked about being able to run a script in distributed fashion. So that's the script for the uni LM as well that we can run. And then this is the one for um, that we can also run using Bertum. One more thing that we can do is to just take a peek at the utils folder specifically for summarization. So I can show you where we defined a bunch of the things that we used here. Yeah, so on the transformers, we, you can see all of, well, let's say for abstractive summarization. So this is where we actually define most of the classes that we were using. This, so this is the Bertum app processor. This is the class where we've defined this. So we wrapped all these things to make it easy for us to leverage the utils that we've given you to make it easy to run your own process. So similarly, we have the same for extractive summarization which defines all the utilities as well for extractive summarization that we used in the notebooks that we created. One more thing is just going to be the Bertsum. So Bertsum, we have all the definition of the Bertsum, the model builder, the optimizers and everything. So feel free to please um, take a look at the repo. It's open source. We welcome contributions. We uh, always accept pull requests. If there's any issue that you encounter, please just open up an issue and we will take care of that.